I, I just tried to call see if you needed anything. So. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Three oh seven. Oh. <laughs> Is your mic on? Huh? Is your mic on? <laughs> hey, how are you? Pretty good. That work? That work? Yeah, that works. Thank you, sir. Hate to see you go, man. Uh, pleasure. Oh, no. Busy, busy time right now. Extreme, extremely busy. Oh, uh, I guess the border commission. That kind of thing. The August 17, 2021 meeting of the City Council of the City of Springfield, Illinois is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. If you'd like to come forward and lead us in the pledge, that'd be great. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks, Bobby. Yep, that's Bobby Edwards from the Elks and <laughs> Veterans, so thank you very much. He ain't playing. <laughs> He's serious. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Alderman Redpath. Here. Alderman Gregory. Here. Alderman Williams. Here. Alderman Fulgenzi. Here. Alderman Proctor. Here. Alderman DeCenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderman Connolly. Present. Alderman Donnellan. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mayor Langfelder. Here. Mr. Mayor, a quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, we do have a uh, proclamation to present to uh, Jim Mall, um, who's with Hanson Engineers, and it's hard to believe that he's already put in 45 years, and we'd like to recognize him and come forward for a presentation. 45 years? Jeez. Wow, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I think uh, city council members and most people from the public would recognize Jim from his great efforts with regards to our rail consolidation project. And uh, for me, that's where I really got to know him. Uh, when I first got into office, we had a spirited discussion with the FRA and got him on the right track, thanks to your efforts. And he's been at it hard ever since, uh, securing funding and representing Hanson Well and the city of Springfield and really moving it on target for a 2025 completion date. So we are indebted for all your efforts to lead us to the future. So the proclamation reads, whereas we take a moment today to show our appreciation to Jim Mall upon his retirement after more than 45 years of service in the engineering field, and whereas Jim started his professional career with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation in Denver, Colorado, in the bridge design section. He was responsible for numerous projects, including the Arizona Highway 95 Bridge, which received an a AISC Bridge Award in 1982, and the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway Bridge. And whereas Jim went on to receive his master's degree from Purdue University in 1980, which was the same year he came to Springfield, Illinois, and joined Handsome Professional Services, Inc., and whereas Jim was vast, has vast experience and encompasses a wide variety of projects, including historic preservation, bridge design, sanitary and storm sewer design, 
railroad facilities design, highway location studies and design, drainage studies, and complex structural systems analysis. And whereas Jim is not only commended for his depth of work, but for his management of public involvement programs for a number of considerable and contentious projects. These projects required a great amount of citizen engagement from public informational meetings and hearings to conversations with resident groups and organizations to meetings with concerned citizens and presentations to government entities, including our very own city council. And whereas Jim has provided decades of mentorship to various engineers and guidance on impactful projects within Springfield, including Capitol Avenue, MacArthur Boulevard, Stanford Avenue, and Springfield Rail Improvements Project. And whereas even though we could not get Jim to stay until 2025 for the completion of the rail, we are, <laughs> we are grateful for the time he has given to get to us to this point. We also thank his wife, Nancy, and sons, David and Brian, for allowing us to have his time as well. And whereas another Springfield resident, Abraham Lincoln, once said, if you intend to go to work, there is no place better than right where you are. We truly appreciate Jim's passion, commitment, and partnership with the city, and thank you for your working right here to improve our great city. Now, therefore, I, James O. Langfelder, Mayor of the City of Springfield, together with our City Council and residents, do confer upon Jim Mole our highest commendation for the manner in which he has performed his duties as professional engineer and community partner. So thank you for all you've done for us. Well, this is kind of overwhelming to me. Normally, you don't see engineers up here getting congratulations for anything. We're usually behind the scenes. But I've been doing planning and design of Springfield's infrastructure for over 40 years now. And fortunately, Hanson has given me the opportunities to work on some of our most exciting projects, including the rail project that's underway right now. And any success I have has primarily been due to the people I have worked with. And I also want to thank the mayor and his predecessors for all that they put in to getting the rail project carried to where it is today. And as of now, we're 50% either completed or underway, and we are still on schedule to have it completed by 2025. And at this point, we're within our budget. And I want to thank this council and the preceding councils, because every time we brought something to them, even some very complex, very contentious issues, they've almost always unanimously supported us in getting this project moved forward and also our state and federal legislatures who work so hard to provide the funding. All of this because it's really such a good project and it's been a lot of fun to be involved in. But most of all, I'd like to mention one person, Nate Bottom. I have worked with public works directors and city engineers in Springfield and all over the state for 40 years now, and there are none better than what Nate is in terms of technical ability, his ability to communicate with people, and his ability and willingness to make decisions. We have a real treasure in Nate here. I don't know if he's here. No, yeah, there he is. Hi, Nate. He's as good as he gets. So thank you very much. Congratulations, Jim. Congratulations, and we do uh, echo those remarks regarding uh, Nate Bottom. He's done a great job on this project and many others, so thank you. The first item on the zoning agenda is docket number 2021-031 for the property located at 850 South 4th Street. Petitioner is Springfield Reynolds, LLC. Present zoning classification is R5B, general residence and office district section 155.021. Requested zoning relief, a variance of 155.056. Minimum required lot area per dwelling unit to allow a four unit residential dwelling on a lot containing 6,384 square feet of lot area instead of the 10,000 square feet required. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is approval. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff. Chair will entertain a motion. Motion to accept the recommendation. Second. We move and second to accept the uh, Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation. For approval, and we appreciate Mr. Morrison making it back. Pleasure so, to see you guys again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other discussion, or do you care to say anything? Uh, no, I appreciate you guys' consideration on it. Thanks for your patience. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Very we'll good. See you next time.
All in favor say yes or vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. And the agenda item passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2021-037 for the property located at 2835 Stanton Avenue or Stanton Street. Petitioner is B Neighbors Affordable Housing for Veterans Inc. Present zoning classification is a PUD in Lake Victoria planned unit development. Residential World requests its own relief of R3B, General Residence District Section 155.018 and a variation of Section 155.056. Minimum required lot area per dwelling unit to allow 18 single family residents dwelling units on a lot containing 61,942 square feet of lot area instead of the 108,000 square feet required by code and section 155.061 basic yard requirements to reduce the rear yard setback requirement from 20 feet to 15 feet. Petitioner desires to develop a residential complex containing 18 individual dwelling units of small homes, each consisting of approximately 546 square feet which will provide clean, safe, permanent, and supportive housing for veterans. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is approval. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation. Chair will entertain a motion. Motion to accept the recommendation. Second. Yeah. And move and second to accept the Springfield Sangamon County Plan Regional Planning Staff recommendation for approval. Any discussion? I don't know if uh, anybody signed up to speak on this. No. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the uh, agenda item passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the... the petitioner wants to say something, although oh, you're not obligated. Okay, sure. You come up, state your name and address got a unanimous vote, by the way. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank the city council for hearing us today. Um, and I'd like to thank the supporters that showed up for our project and also for the veterans who served. Uh, my name is Harvey Hall. I am the president of Be Neighbors Affordable Housing for Veterans. Our mission is to provide clean, safe, affordable housing, permanent supportive housing for our veterans. Uh, our goal is to, is to develop 18 single dwelling homes that is approximately 546 square feet each. Um, we will do it on a land located at 2835 Stanton Street, which was a land donated to us by the Roman Catholic Diocese uh, Lily Flowers Church. It's an acre and a half of land. Uh, I'd like to thank the Planning Commission for taking the time out to go over this, just as Sam is, I'm thinking, thanking you guys for doing this. Uh, the reason I came up, like I didn't have to speak, but I came up anyway, because I want the veterans to know uh, what we're doing. I want the citizens to know what we're doing, because I'd like to commend uh, Sean Gregory for uh, uh, insisting <laughs> that I let the uh, community know what we're doing. And by me working in the community uh, mostly all my life on, uh, in the second ward, I knew to get petitions from the uh, citizens. So I got petitions from the citizens when I first started, but I didn't get the petitions over in Stanford Place. So that's what uh, my alderman wanted us to do. And I'd like to commend the Comeback Veterans MC who participated in helping me get those petitions signed over there in, uh, in that neighborhood. And it was a couple concerns in the neighborhood that uh, one was that uh, the, uh, the property value they worried about their house, which is it's common. You worry about the property value of your house. And another one was a veteran over there. Who was he's a Vietnam veteran who I sat and spoke with, and he had concerns about people always saying they want to help veterans, but really not there for veterans. And he was he was worried about that, and I assured him that, uh, what we was going to do and how we was going to go about doing it. Here, I have the vice president of B Neighbors for the House uh, for Veterans. And I'm let her introduce us. Would anybody have any questions for me? Yeah, how are you going to screen the, your, your applicants for the for the homes? Mm -hmm. Good evening. My name is Cassandra Williams. I'm the vice president of B Neighbors Affordable Housing for Veterans. So to answer your question, 
Let me first tell you a little bit about me, then I answer your question. I have over 15 years experience in nonprofit. I'm a director of a nonprofit organization at this time. So how will we screen? We do case, first of all, we, first we do screening by doing applications. Um, we vet our veterans by application and assessment, okay? So how do that look? You come into our office and you want to apply for housing. So we have an application that you complete. Once you complete that application, you go through a vetting process. And we go through our vetting process through memorial, sorry, my mask on my mouth, excuse me, memorial behavior health. So they will vet our veterans to determine if they fit our eligibility. We look for veterans that are um, looking for affordable homes and that not necessarily needy. All our veterans, veterans are not needy. You know, they have income, they have families. So we're gonna have, uh, that's the process we're gonna do. So we're gonna vet them in that manner. Once they're determined eligible, after they go through the vetting of Memorial Behavior Health, we would decide who best fit our community. So we are very selective as into who will live in the community. So, so are you gonna require DD Form 214, which is their oh, yes. their discharge papers? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will. Alderman, Alderman McMiniman and I are both veterans. Oh, okay. Was, <laughs> and, and Alderman Williams and we is might, a veteran. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And we're working with um, Salvation Army and Housing Authority uh, to assist with vouchers for those who need it. Okay. All our veterans will not need a voucher. So that's our plan of action. We have a learning technology center so they can learn skills to be employable, to manage life. Um, we thought that it was very important to have that center on site. So I call it a, a wraparound service. What does that mean? That means that not only would they have affordable housing, but we would be able to have community um, resources that will come to the site and assist them. Sometimes veterans feel like going to somewhere, and sometimes they don't. We will have it on site for those who may need it. Weekly calendar of events that they can attend to help them stabilize their situation for those that need to be stabilized, and just resources for those that may need employment, help filling out their application for services and so on. So that's our plan of action. We call our homes, homes without walls. You know why? Because in our homes we have monitors so when, vet, so when we have issues like right now, we have masks, we can do assessments through a monitor at their home without them actually leaving their home in situations like that. Or we have veterans who are not feeling their best that day. We can do the assessment from home or their disability doesn't allow them you know, to move that much, we could do the assessment from their home. So when we came up with this plan, we, we thought of everything possible to make this home their home, our heroes their homes, and to gate it. You know why? Because they deserve support too. They need a home to be proud of. They have their own space, all homes, as you see in the package, is disabled, accessible, every one of them. That was intentional. So that's a few things. Any more questions? Yeah, it's my understanding that you're working with the, uh, is it Veterans Affairs or another veterans organization? Yes, we have- Salvation a, Army. Mm -hmm. Salvation Army, um, I'm working with, um, uh, for the vouchers, that way they get mm -hmm. their vouchers from there. They had to meet their criteria also. Mm -hmm. And so we, they do the same thing, assess, make sure they got a DD-214. Because a lot of people say they're veterans, they haven't served. So we watch mm -hmm. out. We got to make yeah. sure we watch out for that. Because this is for veterans only home. Mm -hmm. You have to be a veteran in order to get, and get in this home. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we also have a smart security system as well. Um, we have letters of support from the Salvation Army, Heartland Division, Veteran Services. We have support from Sean Gregory, of course, Ward 2, Alderman. We also have support from Memorial Behavior Mental Health, Behavior Health. We have support from Helping Hands. You guys know Erica. Um, we have support from Doris Turner. She's our state senator, 48th district. 
And we also I know her. Okay, and we also have <laughs> <laughs> Sue Shearer. She's, uh, as you well know too, right? Illinois House of Representatives. So, so far, that's who we have support. You can add all 10 of us because we, right. just, we, we just, just did 10-0 votes. Happy day, Andrew. Is it a happy day? Yes, that's, uh, <clears throat> I'm glad you said that because that's what I was going to say before I close was that um, we would love to get a letter of support from each one of you guys. That would be great. We all voted for it, so you got that. <laughs> oh, wow. So the last thing, let you guys know, we did apply for Ida. Right. All the money. Part. Yeah. <laughs> we did apply for Ida grant, the pre-grant process in October. We'll do the full grant. Uh, LISC. We're working with LISC. LISC on the pre-development part of it. Mm -hmm. And once the uh, pre-application from Ida come back, then LISC. Uh, said we, we meet we meet everything we need in order to get the pre money for the pre qualification. I told her that if Springfield broke, so we can't ask them for no money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll submit you know, a letter of support you know, for that. You guys, okay. you know, I appreciate you stepping up for the veterans, and I know that you got a lot of support. Bobby Edwards called me, mm -hmm. and uh, and all the other veterans are here to support this because there are people out there to take advantage of veterans, and uh, and you guys got. Checked out pretty good, so I think you're. I think I'm on post. I appreciate we appreciate uh, what you're doing for our veterans. It's important. Thank you. And lo the one more thing that a lot of people don't realize that, like when I got out the Marine Corps, all my life my mom took care of me, she fed me, she clothed me, and I left out of high school went straight into the Marine Corps. They they fed me, they clothed me, they housed me. If you didn't get married or get a family, none you never was they you know you never had to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So when I came home, I had to come back to my mom's house. I didn't have nowhere to go, but if I had a facility like this, this is not, if you look at that packet, this is not the, the, the tiny home that you guys see on TV all the time. If you look at this, it's like my house where I live. I have a two bedroom house, you know, this is one bedroom house, just, but it's just like my house. Got the full living room, the bathroom, the, the laundry room, the kitchen, everything. And so you're able to, uh, you know, be there and be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Our veterans need somewhere where they can go and be proud of. It was a veteran, uh, me and Archie was walking, we was walking uh, behind uh, Shell's gas station on Cook Street. And, and uh, there was a veteran back there, Willie, he's my neighbor now. He was homeless back there because of Salvation Army. What they did was put him in a house. They was able to uh, take him, ask, do an assessment on him, and put him in a house. I watched this process happen. And so we can do the same thing. It's not like Mr. Gregory was telling us that you know only one homeless veteran is documented in Springfield, you know. But but what veterans gonna say? Gonna set up? Because veterans we don't consider ourselves as homeless, you know. We might be of need at a time, but we prefer if you do not call us homeless, you know. Call us, you know, we need we need we end up need. It's up to us to take care of our veterans who make it possible for us to be here right now today to have this meeting. They on watch right now, 24 7, making sure we, we say it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hall, if you have the petitions, if you haven't done so, you can give them to the clerk and he'll keep them on file with the uh, zoning petition. Did you write your packet? I do the clerk. Do you have the uh, petition with you? Or if you want to send the copy to him? Yep. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, he got yeah, it. He got it. Very good. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Yeah. I think this is a step forward for for the city of Springfield and our community. The more we get in the community, the better we will be. It's all about team, and we're all team members. Okay? Thank you. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2021-039 for the property located at 821 Durkin Drive. Petitioner is Michael W. Raps. Present zoning classification is S2, Community Shopping and Office District, Section 155.031. Requested zone relief reclassification to B2, General Business Service District, Section 155.034. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is denial as submitted, but recommend a use variance to allow a animal veterinarian clinic with attendant office and accommodations provided these services will not include any outside training or non-medical boarding of animals. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield-Sangman County Regional Planning Staff. Chair will entertain a motion. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I move that we accept the recommendation. Second. Of the uh, uh, Planning and Zoning we, Commission yes, or the- thank you. Pardon me? Sorry, Planning and Zoning Commission. Okay. Been moved and second to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation. And second, any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the agenda item passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2021-040 for the property located at 1630 East Brown Street. Petitioner is Freedom and Holiness Mission and Alice Lyle. Present zoning classification is Office District Section 155.020. Requested zone relief is S1 Neighborhood Commercial and Office District Section 155.030. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is denial as submitted, but recommended a use variance to allow an art photo gallery. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff. Chair will entertain a motion. Okay. So the most the recommendation was to deny this. Nah. But they recommended a use variance uh, to allow the art photo, I think it's more of a billboard than yeah. a gallery, if, uh, if Matt McLaughlin would yeah, explain that. A recommendation to deny the rezoning for right. the use variance for the... Building. Okay, that works. And, and we, we've um, worked on the, the parking situation yes. and, and all that. Okay. All right. Um, Except uh, I move, I make a motion to accept the planning and zoning recommendation. Second. Been moved and seconded to accept the planning and zoning commission recommendation. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the agenda item passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2021-041 for the property located at 1028 North 9th Street. Petitioner is Indurjit Singh. President's only classification is B1 General Business Service District, Section 155.033. Request its own relief amendment to docket 2014-001, striking the language prohibited the sale of 40 ounce and lower single serving beer, single serving wine, and miniature liquor bottles, 1.7 ounce and or 50 milliliters commonly known as airplane size. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is approval. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the Springfield Sangamon County Planning Staff recommendation. Chair will entertain a motion. Uh, I move that we accept the recommendation. Second. Been moved and second to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation. Second, any discussion? Just clarification. So the recommendation is to allow the 1.7 ounce bottles? Yes, uh, so what it does is just put them on par with the other two or three uh, entities that do the same thing already. You know, in the past, we've really, I'm just gonna go with what we've done in the past where we, we don't allow them. We think it's a bad idea to, to sell the 1.7s because people drink them, throw them in the alley, and uh, it's just um, it's, it's a neighborhood issue, so I, I respect the motion, but I, I'm just gonna go with our past practice. Okay, I, I don't know how, f how far back in the past if there's two others already doing it, but I respect your opinion. Yeah, Matt McLaughlin, if you give a little history on this. Yeah, this is a convenience store that uh, they came to the council in 2014 in one of the, the smaller bottles and single servings that it was, uh, I believe it was taken by the owner. But then since passed or no? Or the liquor license part? No. Someone's here to? Sure, yes. If you'd state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Gordon Gates representing the petitioner. This is a case back in 2014, we asked just for a liquor license and we were uh, that, that in the zoning to accommodate that. And a question was raised as to whether or not we would accept on a short-term basis a restriction that nobody else seems to have had at the time, which was the limits on the sizes. We agreed to that on a short-term basis. Um, that was six years ago. At the time, there was two things that um, are true now that, aren't, that weren't true then, and that is whether or not the customers would require it 
and whether or not he would, my client would be a, a good neighbor and would operate a good facility. Both those things are now true. The clients, so the customers do request it because, and if we don't and can't sell it to them, they go literally a block south of us and, and buy exactly the same thing. And if they can't buy it a block south, they'll go two blocks north and one block uh, west. And if they don't have them, uh, three blocks north. So we are in a, a, a competitive disadvantage because we agreed to a, a, a short-term resolution to see if we could uh, address concerns of the neighborhood. I think we have addressed those concerns of the neighborhood, and really all we're asking for now is to just have that removed. We're not asking for additional relief. We're simply asking that this condition that we agreed to be removed. That's all it is. Any other discussion? Just to add some more. Alderman McMinimum. You know, on MacArthur Boulevard, I can think of at least two convenience stores where we have not allowed the 1.7 ounces because we're just concerned about people come in, coming in with a couple of dollars. Uh, they, they get the short little bottle, they drink it, and they might get another one. And uh, we just don't want something so convenient because you can drink that and nobody knows you drunk it. You know, it's real easy to, to drink. And so that's what we're doing on, on MacArthur Boulevard. I can't speak for every ward, but it seems like um, older, older woman um, that preceded you um, and, and other aldermen have also had that point of view. So I just, uh, that's the reason for, for the no vote. Alderwoman Desenzo. Thank you, Mayor. Um, that's not what we're doing on MacArthur Boulevard, because I've walked into Hy-Vee and bought 200 airplane-sized bottles of alcohol for go golf outings. So... Yeah, um, it's at the convenience store, not inside the Hy-Vee. doesn't matter. They're still there. They're still accessible. You can still get them. Well, I'm just saying what we did. It was in the convenience store and up the street at the convenience store at the gas station. That whole neighborhood has been, um, it, it's cleaned up. It's getting better. Uh, I'm convinced that he's trying. Just the fact that he went on the temporary thing, you know, to try to work with the city and has now proven itself is the reason why, how they won my support from the visit and from just hearing the experience of they can just walk west or east and get the exact same thing. So it was a fairness issue for me as well. So... I'm recommending that we vote yes and allow this guy to have fair competition. Call the question. Second. All in favor of the uh, motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And we have uh, eight voting yes, one voting no, and one abstain. Right, yeah. Alderman Fulgenzi? I forgot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is docket number 2021-042 for the property located at 4330 Wabash Avenue. Petitioner is the Tamara L. Mary Trust. Present zoning classification is S2, Community Shopping and Office District, Section 155.031. Requested zoning relief reclassification to B2, General Business Service District, Section 155.034. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is denial as submitted, but reclassification to B1, Highway Business Service District, with a use variance to allow a B2 use as a retail showroom and warehouse. Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, commission recommendation is accept the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation. The chair will entertain a motion. Mayor, I make a motion we uh, accept the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation. Second. Second. Been moved and second to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the agenda item passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2021-043 for the property located at tax ID 13-36.0-300-067, part of located Conifer Drive, Old Jacksonville Road, Petitioner's Springfield Clinic, LLP, contract purchaser, present zoning classification is Sangamon County Agricultural Zoning District. Requested zoning relief reclassification upon annexation to Office District Section 
155.020 and a variance pursuant to section 155.212, general provisions, variances, and sections 155.213, applications for variances for a variance from the sign regulation of section 155.310 through one section 155.325, residential office, commercial and industrial district sign regulation to allow the S1 sign regulations and to permit an additional ground sign for the Seasons Under the Sun Senior Living Facility located at 3511 Conifer Drive as adjoining lot signage per section 155.300A17. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is approval as submitted. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendations. Chair will entertain a motion. Thank you, Chair. I move that we accept the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation. Second. And move and second to accept the Springfield, or I'm sorry, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. <clears throat> the agenda item passes. Alderman Williams, you voted yes. Mm -hmm. Ten voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2021-044 for the property located at 1614 South MacArthur Boulevard, Suite A. Petitioner is Go Brands, Inc. Present zoning classification is S2 Community Shopping and Office District, Section 155.031. Requested zoning relief is CPU pursuant to Section 155.031C6. Conditional permitted uses in the S2 Community Shopping and Office District packaged liquor stores sales except for drive-in or drive-up windows for the sale of alcohol in section 155.210 package liquor sales to allow for the package liquor sales and a variance of section 155.210 b package liquor sales to allow for package liquor sales on a lot within 100 feet of the nearest residential zoning lot church park school community facility or commercial daycare center to apply approximately 5,491 square feet of tenant space in Suite A only. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is approval of requested variance and the conditional permitted use limited to Suite A of 1614 South MacArthur Boulevard. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation. Chair will entertain a motion. A motion to accept the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission with the additional, but with the uh, exception of no 1.7 ounce bottles. This is to be consistent with what we're doing on MacArthur Boulevard. I agree with what Alderwoman DeCenso said that the liquor store at Hy-Vee is selling the small stuff, and I'm against that too, but we did put a restriction on the uh, the um, convenience store at, at Hy-Vee, and there's the liquor store uh, close to this, uh, a um, gas station close to this one where they don't, they're not allowed to sell a small. So we're trying to do on, on MacArthur be consistent with the prior um, restrictions. I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Uh, Harrison Cooper. He is here. Uh, thank you for investing in uh, Springfield and in uh, MacArthur Boulevard. Um, I think Go Puff is a, is a grocery delivery operations and you want to also be able to deliver alcohol products as part of that service, and uh, you're the most downstate uh, location so far for GoPuff. So if you want to say anything, please, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, There's no second on that yet. Yeah. I got a question. Yep. Is there a second? Well, I got a question on the motion, I, I guess. So so are we recommending, Is it, uh, so did he add, did you add something to the, to the, the planning and zoning recommendation, or did, did you, what did, we yeah, made I, a motion to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation with the exception of restricting the 1.7 ounce bottles of liquor, which are the airplane size. So there'd be no delivery of the 1.7 ounce bottles? Yeah, it's a delivery service. Um, so is there a second? And is that a hot commodity to be delivered? No. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of a moot point. Thank I'm just you. trying to be consistent. <laughs> I mean, so is there a second, or should we be discussing this with <laughs> Corporation Council? Well, the proper order would be a motion and a second for discussion. Okay. I'll second it for discussion. Okay. So uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself, we'd yeah. appreciate it. And 
Tell us about your business. Uh, yes, honorable members of the city council. My name is Harrison Cooper. So I'm actually an attorney here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, we are looking forward to having our furthest downstate location in Springfield. So this is a retail sales and grocery business where we do direct delivery to customers who order remotely through their mobile application. Uh, so there are no individuals who actually show up at the location unless they're GoPuff staff members. Um, again, we're looking forward to coming down here. Uh, the only comment that I would, uh, you know, humbly uh, state is that we have not noticed, um, we have not noticed that any restriction on our business actually uh, satisfies our business plan. So we respectfully ask that the recommendation from the Planning Commission uh, is accepted uh, without revision. Well, I'll modify the motion, and if you're saying that's a business practice, you don't sell the 1.7s, is that correct? I said that does not satisfy our business plan. Um, we meet exactly what customers request, and I believe some of the prior concerns that I heard earlier uh, about individuals using that product on the city streets and being able to just easily discard them, uh, that would not be a factor for our business because we do deliver them direct to consumers in their home or whatever location they want for delivery. So you've got no uh, walk-in customers, that is, correct. is that correct? That is correct. So I'll modify the motion. Thank Second. you, Audrey. What's Can we have the modified motion? The modified motion is to accept the Plain and Zoning Commission recommendation. Thank you. Second. I'll second it. Second. I already seconded it. I seconded it again. I'll second it. <laughs> moved by uh, Alderman McMinimum and seconded by uh, Alderman DeCenso to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation. <laughs> Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You did a good job. And the agenda item passes nine voting yes, none voting no, and one voting present. And that concludes our uh, zoning portion of the meeting. <clears throat> this time the chair will recognize Treasurer Busher for the presentation of the financial report. Thank you, Mayor Langfelder. The corporate fund in the month of July had a beginning balance of $38,670,852. We took in total receipts of $11,843,529. We had total disbursements of $8,489,324, which left the corporate fund with an ending balance of $42,025,057. And Mayor Langfelder, uh, please note that that balance of $42,025,057 includes the $16,902,000 of ARPA money. Thank you. That concludes my report. Thank you. Is there any uh, discussion? Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Thank second. You. Been moved and second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chell entertain a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the August 4th, 2021 regular city council meeting so and approve the minutes. So moved. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion Say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council re first reading of ordinances in the record of so the moved. city council meeting. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council reading of the consent agenda in the record of the city council meeting. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to place the consent agenda on final passage. So moved. Second. second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? We do have an amendment, I think. Is that correct? Yeah, we got an amendment. To uh, propose amendment for consent on ordinance number 2021-333. Yes, sir. Did you want to go over that? For that. Just very briefly, one, uh, there are three additional uh, addresses that are being added. One is just a correction, because there are actually two parcels, if you look at the very last page. The other two, I believe, are related to the rail. Make a motion we accept the amendments. Move and moved and second to accept the amendment. Any discussion on the amendment? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. All those in, uh, any discussion on the uh, ordinance as amended? All those in favor of the ordinance as amended, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. 
Then uh, on the consent agenda in its final passage, uh, including the uh, ordinance that was amended, 2021-333, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Consent agenda passes with the ordinance as amended. Yes. Need to vote on it. Do a, a voice on okay. the uh, okay. machine vote. vote. Yes. Whoa. Where are we? Uh, we're You're voting on the, uh, yep. consent, the consent agenda. agenda. Yep, go so ahead. It would be a motion to pass the consent agenda Second. as amended. Yes, that is, right. That's what's before the council right now. All right. Hurry up, John. You got to push the button. <laughs> Oh, yes. I tried to hold out for you, John. <laughs> and the consent agenda passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Agenda number 2021 2029, 2021 254, 2021 255, 2021-289, 2021-336, and 2021-337 remain tabled or in committee. Next item on the agenda is agenda number 2021-306, an ordinance authorizing a supplemental appropriation in the amount of $1,200,903.18 to provide funds to assist in the Salvation Army in operating a safety net shelter for the next 24 months with a grant agreement of 50% and a CDBG subrecipient agreement for 50% of the requested appropriation for the Office of Planning and Economic Development. The chair will entertain a motion to place agenda Number 2021-306 on final passage. So move. move. Second. Chair, I'll obtain a motion to um, adopt proposed amendment number one with regards to 2021-306. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Uh, discussion with regards to that. Uh, Corporation Council, you want to go over the main items on the amendment? Certainly. The, uh, this amendment, uh, you may recall there was some discussion at the uh, Committee of the Whole meeting. This amendment reflects uh, the changes that generally were discussed at the Committee of the Whole meeting, which reduces the agreement or the period of performance from 24 months down to 12 months. It reduces the uh, spending amount from $1.2 approximately million dollars to $477,934.64. Uh, that includes both the proposed operation for the 12-month period of 402,000 plus 75,000 for utilities. And a, attached to that is the revised appendix, which is the, uh, is what I believe was primarily discussed at the committee of the whole meeting. This reflects changes that have been discussed over the last two or three days, and it's my understanding at least that all uh, uh, parties are all participants. The uh, Continuum and Salvation Army and City and so on are all in agreement uh, with the uh, kind of operating plans and the timing and so on. And I don't know if uh, Mr. Sabo is here to, if there's questions or if there are other, uh, the, the only other item of significance is that it does, the parties all agreed that the Continuum would try to present, would present a plan to the Mayor and City Council in other words, their recommended plan by May 1st of 2022, uh, they would come back with a, a, a more comprehensive plan going forward of what uh, what the process for providing services would look like. So that they thought they would be uh, uh, be able to have it done by January, February, but this allowed some extra you know extra time to do that. And they will come back to the city council. Yeah, I don't know, Josh. If you have anything to add, uh, you can come forward if you like or. I do, we do have uh, some individuals signed up to speak. I didn't know if there's any questions to the council before that, or discussion. Alderwoman Conley. Thank you, Mayor. Do we have anyone from Salvation Army here? Uh, $400,000 group? Yeah, I don't believe so. Okay. But Josh probably can answer the question if you have a question with regards to the operation. No, I just, um, I mean, they're, you know, just wanted to make sure everyone was clear on the changes from the original um, ordinance that went forward. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, I, I guess, yeah, Mayor, probably the, my, my first question would be for you. Um, what sort of reporting mechanism are we going to have from Salvation Army for how the, the shelter is operating, the overflow portion of this plan is operating? Because um, I, I did send you, you know, I, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, what sort of, how do you meet metrics, what expectations are there, and how will we know as a council that these funds are, are going to where, um, Salvation Army has has laid out they will go in in this overflow shelter. So, do we have 
a plan for that kind of reporting? We never got anything from last year. Yeah, actually, uh, Josh Sabo can uh, talk about the new process with regards to the number of individuals um, served last year. It ranged from uh, anywhere from 40 to 80 individuals, depending on the day. And uh, remind you that we were going through a pandemic, so when uh, infection rates, you know, started going through uh, different areas, um, there's some entities that wouldn't accept others, <laughs> and so really that was used as a quarantine space. Uh, because of the sheer size of the Salvation Army operation with this year, it's a little bit different where this is going to be uh, more succinct, uh, not going to use the whole building. Uh, it's really uh, based on operational need. Uh, to my understanding, what they'll do first is go to the shelters, helping hands and contact ministries and hopefully uh, find beds there. And then anybody that does not find housing at those locations would be able to uh, go to the overflow shelter operated by the Salvation Army. And then okay. as far as the regular reporting that would be provided, uh, Josh Sabo can report on that because what they're trying to do is link up or integrate the operations similar to what Helping Hands does. And so it just wouldn't be a reporting process for Salvation Army, but it'd be a reporting process for all the agencies of available beds, what's taken up. And uh, so we really can get a true count of what's uh, out there, what's being occupied, and what the gap of services are. Yeah. I guess, and I uh, thank you, Josh, for coming up. I do appreciate that. Um, my my point is more that this grant, the four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars plus, is with Salvation Army. So I I do want to make sure, given that we gave about two hundred thousand dollars last year, and and I understand pandemic and all of that. I, I guess what I'm asking is that we make sure that we as a council get feedback from Salvation Army on how the shelter is being operated, what their, what results they're getting. Um, you know, there's the plan, the Salvation Army has sort of, you know, flexibility in their day hours and their offerings. Um, so it would be good for this council to know, um, and, and we've asked for this, we've asked for the continuum to work together and to bring us a coordinated plan that, that is right-sized and appropriate for our existing needs. And again, this is not questioning that. I appreciate and thank Josh very much all the work that everyone has done to make this clear. I, I'm just saying that as a council, we have a duty to make sure that we know how these funds are spent. And so I guess, Mayor, I'm just asking if, um, you know, if you can, through the Office of Economic Development, make sure that we get reports from Salvation Army on how these funds are being used so that we know that, um, I'm just gonna say, I don't want to be roundabout with this. Um, people are concerned about about the, peop the, the citizens who live on the streets who don't have somewhere safe to go, and they want to make sure that these dollars are being spent to have the most meaningful impact. Um, Four hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money, and we have run this. We've run these shelters that, with different amounts of monies. Um, I'm asking that we get a report back from Salvation Army on on how they're spending these dollars and let us know who they're helping and how they're impacting them. Yeah, with regards to that, uh, let's be perfectly clear. We will spend any amount of money to get people off the streets. But that's, that's not what my the one, question. No, it's my turn. That's what the $1.2 million is for, 24-7 care. So with regards to reports going forward or the past reports, you have to meet HUD qualifications. We have a sub-recipient agreement, so, um, you know, the proof is in the pudding. We'll get you the daily counts last year. We put calls out last year when they were stressed and nobody answered the call. So uh, I think we'll be heading into the same direction. So that's what we worked out with the continuum of care. We appreciate Josh Sable and working with the Salvation Army and the agencies, but it's a group effort and it's clear to that. And it's just not the Heartland continuum of care and the Salvation Army, City of Springfield's part of that. Healthcare community has to be part of that. Thankfully, SIU School of Medicine helped when we reached out for vaccinations when, uh, with regards to uh, you know, the pandemic spreading. And so that's a concern of all of us, so we don't want to tie our hands. But with regards to the reporting, we'll, we'll show you all the reports, but it's going to happen through the Heartland Continuum of Care. And the main reason is so we don't have this, mm, this concept or the perception that the agencies aren't working together when, in fact, they are. And so that's what we want to get rid of that misnomer. But uh, without a doubt, the money is going to be spent to get people off the streets. 
my concern, I'm sure all the council members' concern is uh, making sure nobody falls through the cracks because that's a great concern and that's the challenge for all of us. You know, I've heard a lot about Salvation Army last year, but they were open door. They took whoever needed assistance, they housed whoever needed it, and uh, you know, so that's the direction we're changing a little bit because it, there are gonna be parameters in place to you know, work more in sync with the continuum of care, but the bottom line is the wraparound services. Someone spoke about the veterans. We need wraparound services for the people on the streets. How do we get them off the streets? And if people don't show up, we go out and find where they're at. And that's how that all should work. Uh, but I think Alderman Fulgenzi, but I'd ask Josh to come forward if you'd speak real quickly on the reporting aspect of it, how that will work, uh, that'd be, just, yeah, really quickly, uh, through our data system, we track how many people are in each shelter, and so that those reports can easily be pooled on a monthly basis or whatever the council desires. Uh, the day services, I think that we would need to hear from Salvation Army just in terms of what their what their case management is going to offer, but they likely would be able to give you a count of you know number of IDs or, or those types of services that are provided, um, but we would need to hear from them on that. Thank you. That's that's really what I was asking for. It's It's sure. a lot of money, and I want to make sure that um, that we see the impact on, on the clients who, the residents who need this the most. Yeah. That's, that's all I'm asking. So um, if that's something as a continuum coordinator that you can help um, facilitate, I would appreciate that very much. Absolutely. Thank you. And also just kind of what hours the day, the day services operate. I mean, we obviously can't require people to stay inside 24 um, seven, but we can, it'd be nice to know what are being, what services are offered um, who's, how many people are utilizing them and, and how frequently those hours are available to people. Thank cool. you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, we have Alderman McMinimum, then no, Fulgenzi. I was just pointing out Alderman okay. Fulgenzi. Alderman Fulgenzi. Yeah, I was just wondering, don't we have an audit that's required with these funds that they, they audit the funds? Yeah, Corporation Council. <clears throat> well, the... Um, all of the funds, last year you may recall that they operated for I think about five months approximately. And so the uh, you know billing invoices, all of those kind of things are processed through the normal uh, process of HUD requirements. So there's a complete file on all of the you know payrolls and everything that was done. All right, that's what I thought. Thank you. Alderman Gregory, then Williams and Red Pat. Do you have any? No, let Alderman Williams. Yeah. So um, Josh, I'm sorry, can I call you Josh? I don't know you last, Sa Mr. Sable. Sable. Um, in regards to, uh, you know, when I read the plan, you have the real and tangible documentation that's going on, but what type of data markers will you be utilizing to judge that? Because with this amount of money, we should have measurable outcomes, you know, and right. what kind of data markers would you be using? So on the overnight component, we would be able to tell you how many people access those services each night. So we could give you a, a by night count, if you would like, or a monthly average. Um, so that on the, by, on the nighttime services, we would capture that level of data. On the daytime services, it really would depend on exactly what Salvation Army is gonna offer. And some of that, I know they in the budget is a pathway of hope case manager. And then uh, they also plan to provide light touch case management, so helping people access the identification records they might need to, to pursue <laughs> housing or jobs. So we really would need to hear from them exactly what those case managers will be doing, and, and then we could develop uh, what sort of goals and metrics yeah. from there. Yeah, so but this would include the data for like mental health and substance abuse and uh, using, utilizing the beds in whatever kind of weather, those types of Right. Any, yeah. Any person who's coming to whatever they're dealing with as they come to access those beds would be a part of those counts. And and, and how will they record the uh, the financial piece of this? From the Salvation Army standpoint. Like well, what? see, and that's my problem, Mayor. So one minute we're saying Salvation Army, the next minute we're saying consort. Either we're working together, mm -hmm. and it's the consortium, or sure. or it's not. Yeah. You know, and then all the women can't say, well, the Salvation Army. I, I thought we just passed that, and this sure. was all through you and this new plan, and and you all are working together, are you not? Well, we are a group of organizations, but I have no authority over what Salvation Army does or how they do their accounting or, or what reports their accountants can, can do. That's, that's outside of what I can accomplish from my role. Um, okay, well, so I, I'll just end by saying, so we all are concerned about ending homelessness, 
I, I like your plan that we want to do it within five years. I am concerned that we're going to pass some money and the time is going to go by and we're going to, I asked earlier, do, what's new? Mm -hmm. I was told the experts. So we want to hold the experts accountable and to hold them accountable, we have to ask these types of questions and try to figure out who to ask them to. Yeah. So I think we still need to get some clarity on the Salvation Army Consortium and, and make this all one if we can so we can hold somebody, whether it's through reports or whatever, uh, you provide the council. Because my biggest fear is the citizens come back and say, you spent all that money and there's still a tent city. Absolutely. And to the point I made last, last week, these dollars are for overnight shelter. Yes. Overnight shelter cannot, on its own, end homelessness. It takes supportive housing programs to end homelessness. So, so, this budget, so why do we use language like zero homelessness mm -hmm. in five years if that's not true? Because if you like, the whole proposal is pointed towards we have to develop supportive housing as a community. This is a this will help people have a safe bed off the streets. That's what these dollars are for. As a community, we have to use these home ARP funny monies. We have to use whatever, act, whatever we can to help build up capacity and build up the ability to actually support people in housing alongside of this. Or to your point, we will be in the exact same spot if all we do is offer emergency shelter. Okay, okay. Well, I had other questions dealing with when they have to be put out and day services and sure. things like that. But I'll, I'll, I'll let others. Thank you, ma'am. Alderman Redpath, then Alderman Gregory, then Alderwoman Conley. I was just going to get a point of order uh, uh, on how we're going to proceed. Are we going to adopt all the, all the amendments as one, or are we going to uh, individually do those? Uh, there, is, there is one proposed amendment that uh, sets out basically Appendix A and B. Uh, that uh, basically modifies the subrecipient agreement to incorporate those requirements. Uh, a and B outlines the program or the services and the funding levels for those services for this uh, overflow shelter component. And I think as Josh was starting to say, just to help maybe a little bit, this is really just a first step. So this is that interim thing. I think uh, Josh had indicated the plan is there will be some additional things in the near future as these things kind of roll out. That answered my, answer my question, Corporation Council. I just wanted to make sure that we were incorporating all the changes into yes, one, sir. one amendment. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Yeah, Alderman Gregory. <clears throat> so uh, my, my question, um, Mr. Saibo, would be, um, so why, why wouldn't we need this extra 600 and some odd um, thousand dollars to start in on on housing um, individuals from this encampment, right. from, from Tent City. So we do need it. So when you look at the $500,000 for case managers, when you look at the home ARP funds that are in those recommendations, mm -hmm. that's how you do that. So this, this is one program, right? It's not Salvation Army's job to house the whole community. So what we need is if Salvation Army is interested or you know, Helping Hands is interested, whatever organization is interested in expanding those programs, that's really what we're targeting with that capacity building, those capacity building funds. And then we would be looking for the, the rental subsidy to come alongside that, right? So that capacity building provides those supportive services, those case management. And then, like, for example, the home ARP, the guidance hasn't come on that exactly, but our hope is that that might be able to take care of some of the, the rental assistance so that we can couple those together and really begin to pull people, um, not pull people, but give people the opportunity to take that step into housing. So it's, it's absolutely needed, but it's a, separate, it's a separate operation from this. So are you, <clears throat> where, where, where would, in your assessment, where, what would our capacity be right now to um, house people? Among our organizations, um, it varies, but there, when it comes to permanent supportive housing or rapid rehousing, we don't have a lot of, of open spaces, right? So, I mean, um, rapid rehousing is that, that short term, as soon as we can help a person get stable, the case manager kind of backs out and that, that person is stable. So that revolves a little bit more, more quickly. And as an example, you know, Helping Hands was able to help 50 people last year, right? So when those people sort of get to that place of stability, those case managers are there and will be able to help the next, you know, the next person in line. Um, and then Mercy Communities is developing a rapid rehousing program. And then, the, you know, the work we're doing is getting agencies to say, would you be willing to create a, a program if you had the ability to hire a case manager? And that's, you know, for every case manager, that would be 12 to 15 individuals that case manager could help in housing, depending on the program. Uh, so it would build incrementally on, along those lines. 
All right, I was just asking because, I, I mean, if we're going to have a plan, uh, a long-term plan done by May of 2022, I would I would think we halfway there have an idea of where we're going or, or been working on it. And, you know, I, I'm just more so concerned about not repeating the same cycle and, and being here um, at the same point next year. So I thank you. I'll let others speak. Alderman McConley. Thank you. Um, and um, actually, Alderman Williams, I just want to clarify. The reason I was asking about Salvation Army um, is because exactly this is their one piece of this puzzle, and they're the sub-recipients of this money from us. It's not um, this this 400000 plus is not going to the continuum. It's going to a member of the continuum. So that, that's why I was asking about Salvation Army with, with their reporting and metrics. And, and I, I appreciate you following up because I think that it is important that we have quantifiable uh, numbers to look at and, and ways that we can we can really assess this. That's why we've asked, you know, this this group and, and the larger group in the community to, to really step up and bring us a coordinated approach. So um, and if I could just myself say again, thank you. I know there's been a lot of skepticism that we can't do things differently in the city. I, I think our continuum is um, is showing leadership and and, and cooperation and I'm very excited for the possibility that this may bring to, to people who are really living um, in the most vulnerable, there are most vulnerable vulnerable community members. Um, I will just say, um, Alderman Gregory, I recently had the experience of working with a woman who is older, much older, um, and the amount of time and energy uh, working with one of your agencies that it took to get her out of a hotel situation with her one suitcase and, and into an apartment with belongings that she thought she had lost. I mean, it was, it's a heavy lift. It's a, it's a lot of work. And I, I appreciate very much what every one of your agencies do to help people in this community. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some very positive impacts. And thank you very much for everyone for stepping up. Please share that with all of your members, everyone. Absolutely. We appreciate them very much. Yeah, really. Uh I want to touch on the day services because that's a, uh, our greatest opportunity and uh, greatest concern because I hear Salvation Army's in charge of day services. Well, if the structure's working correctly, everybody should be involved with that. The health care, that's why I put $100,000, which the council approved, which we are thankful for, the mental health specialists. Their dedication is for people on the streets and Salvation Army's overflow. And so that's where their 100% dedication needs to be to help them out and get them to a better position in life. But that's with all services. I mean, these are individuals that need the most help. They're the hardest to house. And if we, you know, we should think of the housing as a supportive ladder. And so you have the ones that need the most help. They're on the bottom, below the bottom rung. They're on the streets. The first rung is the overflow shelter, the low barrier. The next rung is probably what other agencies are doing. Next rung, you hopefully get them to Springfield Housing Authority. The next rung above that is what you're talking about with uh, being able to be on their own or what have you. So each rung needs supportive services to get them to the pathway of support. And so if we do not have the supportive services at any one of those levels, they're going to fall off the ladder. And that's where it needs to be. And with the case management, we should not be silos to ourselves. That's why I hear when everybody throws out Salvation Army, it's an easy, uh, you know, dart to throw at somebody to cast blame. We're not here to cast blame. We're here to provide the financial support because if we cannot figure this out in the next two years, might as well mail it in. I mean, we, what's our cash balance, uh, uh, Treasurer Busher? $42 million. I don't care what it takes. We should figure it out. And the one area that you can make sure there's efficiencies is with the case managers. Case managers are there not to serve one entity over another. They're there to serve the homeless. I come from banking. You know, you had uh, different bankers. They served all areas. They cross-trained. And so they should be following up on their particular cases, sharing it with each other so they know Joe Smith doesn't show up to the shelter on a freezing night. We should find out, we should already have an understanding where are their hangouts, who do they hang with, and find out where they're at. And that's how that should work, and get them into the supportive housing system necessary. But we all should be collaborating together 
not fighting amongst each other, not saying this entity should be this or this. How do we identify the gaps and really build the relationships with each and every person, starting with the people on the streets? So that's what I've pledged to do. That's uh, we just recently brought forward to HUD our um, our annual plan, and that was the focus with regards to people on the streets, the hardest to house, and how do we move them up that ladder of supportive services and get them into the housing that everybody wants them to have. So that's, uh, but the day services is key so we can assess the individuals, which uh, we lost those opportunities each and every year. We talk about we don't want to repeat the same thing. Well, if we don't take care of the day services, we're repeating what we've done for the last five years because every time the overflow shelter was the model that was brought forward, we never changed off of that. And that's why we went forward with the 1.2 million. But what we want to do is support the uh, continuum of care, all the agencies, which we're one of, and move forward in that collaborative effort to make sure that we get everybody off the streets, not only do that, but assess their situation and find out how we can connect them to the services that they need and get them into a better housing uh, situation. So I, I do, we do have a couple people signed up to speak. Uh, do you have a list there? Yes. <clears throat> Angela Harris. Okay. Okay, that's all that's signed up. Someone no. wants to come up and speak? Oh, Mike Moore. If you'd state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. Okay. Uh, my name is Michael Moore. I reside at uh, Total Tuesdays Adam Street. I'm a homeowner, part of the Pioneer Park uh, Neighborhood Association. Well, here we go again. How can public funds be used when the public has not been part of this discussion? Why rush into this proposal when we would have, when we'd like a hearing to weigh in and provide suggestions and concerns? What happened to the right of the homeowner? Everyone has rights. Homeowners have the right to protect their home value. We pay taxes. People who live in the community that this proposal impacts the most should be part of the discussion. Prior to being uh, uh, present, why wasn't the plan made public? How are these financial benefits the most allowed to disperse the funds? Is this conflict of interest? Where is the other site? Our ask is not to rush this proposal, but include those of us that are most impact to weigh in. Most recently, an independent council presentation findings that this console concept was dated and found unacceptable. Why aren't you listening to your paid experts? I live direct view of this location, and I'm currently plagued with an increase of criminal activities. There are numerous calls being made to the police department to address this influx of shootings, stolen properties, and speeding traffic and other activities. Lincoln Magnet Schools has taken an increased security and measures to protect the children who come from all wards of this city. We are tolerant when, we, when the other social services we refuse to help the homeless population. We were silent when the Salvation Army went back on their word and did not be in the sheltering business and would be good, good neighbors. We were silent when we asked to allow the city to develop a plan. But we are unable to continue our silence. Our homeowners matter just like the downtown business matters. This problem needs to be shared with the other side of Springfield. Now I yield the rest of my time to our president, Angela Harris. Thank you, Mr. Moore. I'm Angela Harris. I'm president of Pioneer Park Neighborhood Association. I want to start with what I have to breathe just a little bit and be moving my mask. I want to thank the mayor. Um, mayor Lane Felder did not turn his back on the homeless when the nonprofit organization turned his back two years ago. I believe Alderman Williams mentioned that a few sessions ago. I thank the mayor for allowing Pioneer Park to 
really let him know how we felt about some of the proposed plans. I had a conversation with him. I needed a sureties. I want to thank Alderman Gregory. He, too, has been voicing, why aren't we at the table? Josh Sable just met him a week ago. This proposal affects Pioneer Park residents who have been very tolerant of working with the mayor as he tried to address an issue that the social service agencies turned their back on. Again, I thank you. I thank you for your commitment, Mayor Langefelder, to us. And your commitment to us is that this particular structure will be demolished. And if I understood by the amendment made tonight, which I don't have a copy of, I wasn't informed of it, but by verbal conversation last week by Josh Sable, and seeing that the mayor is in agreement with this amendment to his ordinance, that this particular structure will be demolished in 12 months. I'm in favor of that. 12 months is what the commitment is to Pioneer Park residents, that we have been tolerant. We have been very tolerant. I ask that every alderman sitting on this platform, except for Ward 2 and 3, commit to working with your landlords within your prospective communities to commit to accepting the vouchers for the homeless in your area. You care so much, put your money where your mouth is and commit to making sure homeless have homes, not a structure to reside in. You speak so eloquently about caring. The only person that I know that cared about the homeless was the mayor when he asked the Salvation Army to step to the plate and open that warming center so no one died. The only other individuals that I know cared about the homeless were Pioneer Park, who were there at the feeding centers. They were there. We were there helping with the Meals on Wheels, the meal train. It was my concept. You didn't know it. But I gave them the concept and said, ask the community to help. Now I'm asking you, you're asking us again to tolerate another structure. And again, I commend the mayor. I gave him my word. I support what you're trying to do, Mayor Lane Felder. I thank you. Sean, Roy, thank you. You have week after week after week said, where are those of us directly impacted? Now, there's a million dollars that's come available. And miraculously, there's agencies willing to open their doors. We have a tent city, if I'm not mistaken, Alderman Williams did a visit to one of those social service agencies and found 25 empty beds. Blocks away, we've got homeless people, homeless vets and others who were denied admittance. I asked on behalf of Pioneer Park, Mayor Lanefelder, please keep your word to me. The amendment is 12 months, demolish the structure to the alderman around the horseshoe beside wards two and three, because we have three homeless shelters right now. We have low income housing on the east side. Open your wards. I have a question for you. Which one of you guys are willing to accept the, the challenge and say you, you will talk to your, your landlords? and ask them to take on 35 vouchers. We have 50 homeless, if I'm not mistaken. I've heard that number. Thank you, Alderman Conley, Honor, Alderman DeCento. The rest you, of you guys, I'm waiting. If you'd uh, direct the comments to the chair, one point of clarification with regards to the structure that was, uh, I stated that I'd, it'd be transitional for two years, not one year. The one year amendment came from uh, Others, but uh, what we want is that ability in case we need to 
that's what it would be used for. In answer to Mr. Moore's uh, question, why here? Because it was used for adult rehab facility previously, but uh, the original ordinance was for two years. And then uh, with regards to that structure itself, uh, you know, it could be demolished. If, if it's used for any other purpose, you would have to engage the community to make that determination, you know, if it's used for something else. But when we went through that whole structure, I mean, it was pretty clear that it's, uh, you know, pretty large. It's not worth pouring a lot of money into it. Can you tear off part of it and use it as retail or uh, some other fashion? I'm not sure, but uh, demolishing is definitely an option. Uh, adaptable reuse would have to be um, taken into consideration for the neighbors around there, but it wouldn't be used for shelter services after this stint. Point of clarification. Mm -hmm. Thank you, duly noted. I have not heard from the McMenamin or any of the others, Alderman. And I like a commitment from you that you will look into your prospective wards and ask your landlords to commit to accepting vouchers for the homeless. Thank you. Alderman, or Alderman Conley, did you have? Uh, a, well, yeah, I, I guess I did. I, I think you clarified it, Mayor. I had a question about a commitment to demo the Salvation Army because the original plan that you brought forward did have um, people housed 24-7. I mean, it was a 24-7, right. well, almost 20, overflow with day services all housed at the Salvation Army building for the <laughs> next two years. And I, I have asked this at prior meetings um, of, of our public works director. We bought this building. The reason we own this mm -hmm. is because of the rail project. And we bought it because part of it absolutely does have to be demolished because it's part of that rail project. This is not our building just to keep going for as long as we need to. Um, and I do want to point out to you, and I, I don't know if you, you um, there's a lot going on, so I don't know if you caught this in the, in the conversation, but part of, the, part of what the continuum brought to us was also a request that the city and that the continuum connect with faith leaders and have a community-driven <laughs> response to where should overflow be located. Because instead of doing, you know, again, Mayor, you, you brought your plan forward and we appreciate that, but instead of committing right now to two years at the Salvation Army, um, making that a, a right-sized overflow and, and having, it, having it placed within the community in an appropriate location. I will tell you, um, Ward 8 has a number of low-income housing. I have it, I mean, it's, it's spread throughout our community and um, I absolutely will, I'll work with any landlord in my ward. I, I think that when you have people who are, are housed with supportive housing, with the kind of case management and, and resources that that brings, it's, a, it's important to have, have those people everywhere in the community. We have bus routes that go everywhere throughout this city. We can have housing throughout this city. And, and I will tell you right now, you'd be surprised at where people are housed. It is not just wards two and three, it's all over the city. I understand that, I respect that, but I Thank do you. know that the density is on wards two and three. Okay, and that's why, and I thank you for committing, you and Alderman DeCenso, for committing to the community. Because this is a community issue. This is not ward two and three east side issue. No. The homeless is a Springfield shared issue that we're asking respectfully that you become a part of it because we haven't been a part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. I am not aware of a lot of the dialogue because we haven't been at the table. We would like to respectfully ask that we are at the table prior to the decisions being made that affect us. That's all I have. And then Alderman Williams. Yeah, I was just wondering about the vouchers you mentioned. That was mentioned are, are by they... Sable last week. Uh, I think they were vouchers after they've gone through a whole process, not just pass out vouchers. It takes a while to earn the vouchers. It's not something everybody has. My understanding upon a conversation with the executive director of the Springfield Housing Authority, there is a program in place that will walk those who are homeless to be ready to receive those vouchers. And they do, yes, have to follow every program guidelines for any other vouchering system. 
It is, the vouchers aren't labeled for homeless, they're vouchers, but they have been dedicated to house the homeless. And we have been dealing with this particular issue for, as the mayor mentioned, five years. And I couldn't tell you any data that says of the 50 homeless we were told three years ago that we had, how many have housing? I don't have any of that data. And I, the commitment here is that you're going from a low barrier shelter to permanent housing for homeless. You're asking the community, again, the east side, so, Pioneer Park Neighborhood Associations, who are homeowners, to tolerate this again. And we're saying we're going to do this on behalf of the mayor because he's given us commitments. Now, I'm simply asking not to debate with you, not to debate, because I'm not at the table. Well, I'm not privy to the information. And Alderman Fidenzi, you know, I adore you. I've known you a but long I, time. I, you, yes, you have. <laughs> and so I, I don't have all those particulars because we have not been privy to the conversations. And that is a problem here. I, I know, but I'm, I guess I'm confused about the vouchers. Who yep. gets these vouchers and who has them and what do you do to earn them? The yeah, they go through the uh, Springfield Housing Authority. Uh, the previous presenter, when they are talking about veterans housing, it's called VASH. Uh, those are veterans uh, certificates that they can use for uh, landlords that accept them. And so they have to qualify under the Springfield Housing Authority's guidelines uh, with regards to that. But uh, with the pandemic, they've issued vouchers associated with homeless. And so I think there's 35 uh, or so vouchers in that category. The one big change, though, is uh, I met a gentleman just a couple of years ago. He'd been on the streets for 10 years, eloquent person, and been on the streets. He couldn't get into the system because of the, uh, he had a past felony record. Uh, didn't go into details what it was, but they've changed that through the federal law. So that will uh, remove one of the obstacles to house individuals that previously could not be housed. But it really, it's a, a collective effort with the housing authority, with landlords, uh, responsible landlords, mm -hmm. and the agencies, everybody working together to um, you know, identify the individuals that would qualify and um, have that ability to uh, find housing through the vouchers that are issued and awarded to the housing authority. But again, that's uh, working with the agencies through the continuum of care uh, to move forward in that direction. Thank you. Thank and you Alderman, all Alderman Williams. Oh, yeah. So uh, first I want to thank you for your comments and your, your passion and concern. I, um, you know, I've talked to folks at Madison Park Place, Pioneer Park, Matha Wells, you know, all the organizations over there that are, are not in at the table. For whatever reason, they're not at the table and they should be. I, I, I just said a couple of meetings back, mm -hmm. oh, you guys are talking about apartments in Ward 8, and they have to sign off, and they have to be, and, and I told them, we should be doing the same thing for you guys. So I just want you to know, know that uh, we have to keep hitting that and hit until they actually do that, Till Josh and his team, Salve, all of them start meeting with you guys, getting you guys involved to kind of at least make you feel like you have some say instead of this is what we're going to do. I'm not crazy about the SHA. I, like I told them, because all y'all's land and property and, and uh, complexes are still on the east side. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we get them off the streets, we get, they're still going, so, so I still have some issues I have to work out. But the biggest thing is, I know that we already got helping hands, uh, Catholic, well, we got like three shelters mm -hmm. and some other things already. And, and I agree with you 100%. We just have to share this problem. It just cannot be fixed. And I'm not saying you guys don't want to, but surely we have to tell them same experts as a council, well, we want you to look other places, you know, and, and then maybe we can break this up to where these communities and these organizations that you're speaking of and that I just named won't feel the way they feel. So I appreciate you coming, and I, uh, that's all I want to say, Mayor. Yeah, as far as uh, one thing I should say, and uh, Josh Sabo or anybody can correct me if I'm wrong, but the... Uh, strategic plan that the city, the county, uh, Land of Lincoln Foundation funded and others involved with that 
uh, process, I believe they are including a part of that is Gina Latham. She's going to, she's coordinating community discussions. Part of that will be the uh, neighborhood associations associated with that. So that will be part of the discussion to come up with the permanent solutions and yeah. hear everybody's concerns and ideas associated with that uh, before they finalize that whole plan. Yes, uh, I understand that as well. It has to be at a time where people can meet. Most people in the area are working, and they can't meet at 10 o'clock for breakfast. Mm -hmm. So you have to be conscious of inclusion means asking availability. That first meeting's tomorrow. I'm sorry. Okay. That first meeting's tomorrow, and I'll, I'll share that with them, with Gina's group, what you're thank saying you. about time. Alderman Gregory. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Angela, and our, our friends from Pioneer Park, um, as well as anybody here in this interest. Um, I, I, I think we're in a unique position to to take a to take a step to try to help this this struggling population that, to me, is just they, they don't fit in anybody's um, program, and we, we need some work in that. Um, regardless where, where this vote lies tonight, um, the condition if we're going to have um, you know, uh, people staying in this building, um, it, 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 we we have to do so much better, and that's that's on the city side, and 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 you know for the for the constituents of Pioneer Park and uh, um, Madison Park Place who who have uh, some issues of their own they're dealing with, you know, in their own area. Exactly. Um, you know, I apologize because the, we have to get better at, 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 at you know, um, going forward for people going to stay there, cutting the grass, these weeds. It has to look like, you know, something, first of all. It, it can't just look like this abandoned building um, that we're just letting people go, go, go stay in. That's the least that we can do. I think um, while this 12 months, we have to take care of it just like this city hall. Um, and, 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 you know, f for me, I think we have to put some money in there to ensure that happens um, um, or, or else it's just going to be, you know, a, a mess that we'll continue to deal with. And I, and I, and I don't think we have to. I, I think we, we have enough funds to really make this work um, strategically and nicely um, and, until we figure out game plan, long-term game plan. Next, uh, thank you. Next speaker we have signed up is Teresa Haley. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. I'm here to speak about the homeless. As you know, the NAACP is opposed to any type of homeless shelter on 11th Street. The NAACP purchased a building just over a year ago, and we are trying to clean up 11th Street. This past weekend was the 113th commemoration of the 1908 race riots. Alderman Gregory, myself, and others, we did a bike ride. And as soon as we got to our marker, on the east side, right across the street from the Salvation Army. People couldn't even focus on what we were doing at the race riot marker. They were looking across the street on what was happening with Tent City. It's embarrassing, it's shameful, and we need to do something about it to clean it up. I stood here a few years ago and said that the NAACP will sue you if you put the homeless shelter on 11th Street or on the east side. We have approximately 22 social service agencies on the east side, minus the UPC who's left. We need to do better, Springfield. It is not the east side's problem. It's all of our problem with homelessness. I drive out to White Oaks Mall. I see homeless out there in the daytime. But in the evening, somehow we find transportation to bring them back downtown and on the east side. Enough is enough. If you're looking for locations, there are a lot of abandoned old buildings here. You have Shop and Save, Wabash at the corner. You can utilize that building. You have Shop and Save on North Grand. You can utilize that building. The NAACP asked that we consider putting a homeless shelter right next to the bread line. Pretty much a one-stop shop. It's right next door. It's right in the middle of the medical district. You talked about mental health. You talked about day care service or day service. All of that is right available in that area. What is the problem? Quit putting everything on the east side and expecting us to still be okay with it because we are not okay. 11th Street says reconciliation way. What are you all doing to reconcile? 
What are you all doing to make a difference for all of Springfield? Wards two, ward three, ward five, any other ward. We stood here before. The homelessness are not going away. It's going to continue to be a problem. Quit throwing money at it and get out there and walk and talk with people and find out what their issues are. Invite them into your homes, invite them into your organizational structures and see what their issues are and how we can help resolve them. As Angela says, sometimes we're not at the table. And when we are invited to the table, and I can honestly say, Josh has reached out to the NAACP and invited us to be at the table. But Angela pointed out, when we're invited to be at the table, it's doing work hours. I work during the day. The meetings are at 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. What about having evening meetings? When the community and community organizations who look like me and some of us in this room today can be available to really give the input that's there and that's needed. Yes, Gina Lathan does a great job, but she does not speak for all black people like I don't speak for all black people. Allow Pioneer Park residents and everyone else, taxpayers, to come out and voice their opinions and see what we can do as a community. We are one Springfield, isn't that correct? We are one city council. The homelessness problem is our problem. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion on the ordinance as amended? Did we approve the amendment? Yet? No, sir. Okay. No, no, first. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. <clears throat> Motion carries. Any discussion on the ordinance as amended? All those in favor of the ordinance as amended vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance as amended passes nine voting yes, none voting no, and one voting present. Next item on the agenda is 2021-321, an ordinance authorizing a contract with GE Steam Power Inc. for the inspection of the unit number 33 for vibration issue for an amount not to exceed $195,000 for the Office of Public Utilities. Chair will entertain a place motion place the agenda number 2021 321 on final passage so move second and move and second any discussion alderman donnelly thank you mayor just a quick question of the staff uh, i noticed on the uh, contract report there was a ordinance that or excuse me there was a uh, approval for a vibration study back in july how does this interrelate with this ordinance so when the unit tripped, it came off, it vibrated coming off, we did some repairs. Before we put it back on, we hired them to come in to tell us what Scott, the Scott, could yep. you speak into the microphone? Sorry. When, when it tripped, the unit vibrated when it came down. We called them in to, when we went to put it back on, to take vibration data so we could tell, they could tell us what the vibration was, and it was an imbalance. So that's when we went further into look. Or what it was. So that's okay. what that was. Thank you. That I just yep. wanted to understand it. Thank you. Any other discussion? Alderman McMinimum. Uh, this is an ordinance to spend 195000 to look under the hood of Unit 33. This um, We know there's going to be another roughly $800,000 of repairs if we would go forward. Uh, so this 195000 is to look to see if any more spending beyond the 800000 needs to be made, as I understand it. This is um, the unit that was built in 1978. It was only, based on what information I have, it's only operated 30% of the time last last calendar year. It's, it's a low operational unit. We, res we paid for uh, advice, paid money for advice two years ago when we did the integrated resource plan proposal program. We spent, we spent money for that, and at that time, the experts told us shut down units 31, 32, and 33. And so I, th I think we should have followed that advice two years ago. We're just dragging our feet, I think, on this, and I think we need to move into the future, get behind the older cold units, and, um, and focus on the future, on uh, keeping unit four operationally sound and uh, deciding on the long-term contracts to purchase off the market and to invest. We've got some proposals out there to invest with um, the other sources of, of electricity and, and move in that direction. So I think we're just putting 
more good money after bad money on this, and I think we just got to, you know, cut bait and uh, move forward and put all our attention uh, towards the future instead of dragging out this um, very old unit. We, it's been operationally, operationally prob problematic for many years, and this is not a surprise. This is the same unit we spent $6 million on two years ago, and, and we paid out $1 million deductible. This is the unit that we quit insuring a year ago. We quit insuring this unit a year ago. So I think we just got to face reality and uh, cut bait and move into the future. Alderman Hanar. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, where are we at on getting our, um, our infrastructure built up to be able to take the power we need off the grid? How far out are we to, before we're able to do that? My, my concern on this, and I look, I'm I'm in a situation where I I'm fa I'm in favor of cracking this open to see what's wrong. If if it's something we can we can repair fairly reasonable, especially with the price of, of power right now, um, you know we might be able to get some money back. But my concern is is our our um, our transmission lines aren't aren't ready to, to to take the power from the grid that we need, and that and you said that we were that was a, that was something we were trying to get up, and I thought it was next year that we were going to be completed. So, you know, COVID kind of changed that a little bit. So it's reduced our load last year. It, you know, it declined, and it's uh, never really come back to the full extent for one. Uh, one of the transmission line upgrades is complete. They're still installing some of the capacitor banks, um, but you know, COVID also delayed some of those installations to do some different factors. But um, and uh, but the, the but the issue is this summer we're, we're going to be fine without 33, of course. Um, so and by next summer we'll have you know everything installed. So that's not really going to be an issue. What about winter? Our load is not as high, though, in the winter as it is in the summer. And it actually is going to be done this fall. It'll be done with the cat banks. Alderman Fulgenzi. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed part of your discussion, but is there any reason why we have to find out what's wrong with the unit? Does it help in tearing it down later, uh, selling parts of it? Uh, is there any reason to do that? The only reason to open it up right now is just to inspect it to see how much more damage there could be. Uh, that way we can get a full, uh, basically, you know, not, not really a report, but a full proposal from GE on what, what it would take to fix the unit. But there's nobody that's going to, GE's not going to pay, for, I mean, our insurance is not going to pay for it. It's, it's all not, on it's, us. It's, yeah, it's all on us because Unit 3, it's not that we choose not to insure it. It cannot be insured. There is no insurance companies that will insure those older units. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Williams and then Alderman Conley. So when is the actual offline for this unit? Ain't this the unit that has a, a death date? The, yeah, so it's a, there's a no earlier, what we were shooting for was no earlier than September of this year, no later than uh, September of 2023. So and the 2023 date is really set because of compliance issues for environmental right. compliance. Sure. So to me, that's just so close. I mean, that's so such a short period of time and an awful lot of money just to open up some to look and probably spend even more money. So what what would it make between them time periods? If, if you got it open, you saw what it was and got it fixed, um, and we paid whatever, how much, and then when, when you estimate being back online and how much would you make before their mandated close date? Well, it's almost impossible to tell you how much we're gonna make for sure because the market fluctuates too much. Just like this past summer, you know, we're seeing prices that are in the mid 30s, kind of for the better part of July um, and August. Um, but those prices could go back down to the to the 20s again. Okay. Um, especially with natural gas prices, they'll probably fall by by next year. 
Um, but I can, what I can tell you is that if we spend a million dollars to fix the unit, it's going to be roughly probably about uh, a month, maybe a month and a half if the prices are in the mid-30s okay. to make that money back that we've spent on the unit. Um, so, that, you know, there's more than likely that will happen with the prices. Um, but what we don't know is as we open this up and GE comes back and they tell us what their final proposal is, the, the, the prices might be much more expensive and it might take much longer to fix, um, which would impact the decisions on how we move forward. Yeah, so, so, so my problem with this is the timeline with the mandated closure and, and the unknown right now of the expense, you know, that, that's, that's taken place and also what you spoke of last uh, last time you was up here speaking on the employee issue piece of it, of the natural that they may go to other parts sure. and other places and dwindle down to the point. Uh, did I misunderstand you when you said, and then it's possible we wouldn't have the manpower? Right. So at some point we will, we will lose enough employees, enough operators, okay. that we would not be able to safely operate the unit 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. So uh, with that, then we would have two choices. One is to shut it down or hire more operators, uh, you know, post positions, hire them externally, um, only basically to lay them off, mm -hmm. you know, within a year or two. Thank you. Hello, Mayor Conley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, actually, Doug, you've already answered my questions about the timelines that we've already established. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any other dis oh well sorry, Alderman Proctor. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And I kind of lost track of this about two weeks ago. So then what is the outside the jobs why why do this then? Uh, I mean the only thing that gets you uh, you know really is it's more time for maybe the coal mine to you know adjust their manpower down. Um, I mean they know this is coming, but um, it's a little bit quicker than probably what they had planned because I, I think the, the, the ideal thing was to try to keep it on a little bit longer anyway, not just, you know, shut it down uh, now, essentially. Um, and then, uh, you know, really for the employees, it's, it does allow them to keep their jobs longer, but it also impacts, you know, the people that are trying to get other jobs now, too. So it's kind of a, a juggling effect, really. As our chief utility engineer, our chief technical expert on this, <laughs> do you recommend doing this? <laughs> yeah, I think I answered that the last time, yes. And can you remind me why that is? Can you remind me why that is? Uh, I'm trying, but, uh, basically, it was just to allow us the time to make sure that we, we know exactly what's wrong with it. Um, and then uh, that allows us to see also what, kind of what the market's doing here this fall, um, where it's going, if it's going to stay higher or lower. Thank you. Any other discussion? Just all the woman Conley. Thank you. Just real quickly, um, just what portion of, of your overall budget is um, is one hundred ninety five thousand dollars? When you said it could take about a month to earn back a million dollar investment, so I mean, on the scale, what percentage? Like if we put two hundred thousand dollars into this, and, to, and your overall budget was how much? Oh, I mean, you're t I, it's, it's, it's a very small percentage. I mean, right. So just to look uh, under the, because I will tell you, I, I I agree again with um with Alderman Hanauer. Two hundred um, million. Uh, three hundred. Well, I can tell you if you. Yeah. If you I, I just well, I just, I just want to say I, I I think it's in the overall scope of your budget, looking under the hood for this, even at two hundred thousand dollars, which sounds like a lot of money to me is not a big impact on your budget, but it does give you a better sense and a better way to manage and plan for the next year, year and a half on how we're going to be, what adjustments we need to be making. I, I think it also gives a little more clarity on, uh, you know, a final decision on 33. Right, that's what I meant. I mean, it's not. That's, that's what it's really providing. It's okay. gonna provide a very clear picture on what it's gonna take to do the work. And then if it's too much, then we'll go from there. But I think the plan itself is about $100 million. Budget-wise, sorry. Alderman Hanauer, then Alderman Donnelly. Yeah, real quick. I mean, we last, I think it was last meeting, or meeting for, I guess the last council meeting, I, I want to say we, 
we spent three hundred thousand dollars, four hundred thousand dollars on cooling towers and everything else. That I mean, it's just <clears throat> this is drop in the bucket. I, I'm, I'm not going to say it's a drop in the bucket. It might be a big drop in the bucket, but but you know, this is what what we you know we we do now. I'll. I'll be the first to admit if if they come back and they say it's going to be three million to to, to re, re, you know fix it and it's going to take six months, we all know that 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 just doesn't yep. make sense. But I think that if we can make our money back, we we ought to you know we can make our money back and then make a little bit more, you know, if we get good news. And that's that's the that's the only thing I'm banking on is that hopefully we will get some good news. And, and, you know, that'd be good for the rate payers. Now, you know, if, if we don't get good news, we spent 190 and at least we know where we're at. It's a final deal. There's not going to be a lot of discussion on having to, having to shut it down. We all know that's what will happen. Um, but it, I think if it, it's a case where we can make our money back right now, it's something we, we would do. You don't just... Just because a car is old, you don't just, you know, you at least take it to the shop and see where you're at, you know. I, most of us do. I, I can't afford just a junk car. It, it's kind of the same way here. And in the grand scheme of a, of a hundred, what, what is it, a 200, what, what's, what's your budget this last year, 200 was, million? Well, but the, I think the plant, the power plant generation is about yeah. 100 million. Roughly. Yeah, so, you know, that's, that's not very... That's not a real large amount of, of money for a $100 million plant. Alderman Donlin, then Alderman McMinima. Yeah, Mayor, you know the beautiful part about being called uh, after Ralph, Ralph Hanauer is uh, he said mostly what I was going to say, so thank you. But I, and I won't be repetitive, but I will say that um, you know, I was skeptical when this ordinance first came forward. I intend on voting for this ordinance for the reasons that Mr. Hanauer stated. Um, and uh, we're going to obviously have some hard decisions to make here in the next few few months. So thank you. Yes. Alderman McMinima. Yeah, I, there's a lot of wishful thinking here. I think we're, we're really fooling ourselves. This is a junk car that hasn't worked for two months. Uh, two years ago, it didn't work for you know six months while we sent major parts down to Texas. Uh, it's going to take, I don't know, a month to look at under the hood, and then who knows how many more months to fix it. And we know we got to junk it in two years anyways. And meanwhile, we got all this operational staff devoted to that power plant, Unit 33. What are they doing with their spare time? And we know that last year it only operated 33% of the time. That's a lot of downtime for staff. Uh, in the operating room, because as I understand, they can't just go over to Unit 4 and operate over there. Um, so we've got all this idle time, and we're not counting that idle time as lost time and money. So you'll probably have a good answer to that, but I just think we're fooling ourselves. Let's move into the future and, and uh, cut bait. Call the question. That's well. Second the motion to call the question. All in favor. <laughs> uh, the motion, vote yes. To approve the ordinance, those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. The ordinance passes, seven voting yes, three voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2021-327, an ordinance authorizing a two-year extension of RFP VM18-13 with Motor Parts and Equipment Corporation doing business as Napa Auto Parts for T turnkey parts store operation for an amount not to exceed $3,300,000 from August 1st, 2021 through July 31st, 2023 for the Office of Budget and Management. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2021-327 on final passage. So moved. Second. Hey, it's been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes eight voting yes, one voting no, one voting present. Next item on the agenda is 2021-342, an ordinance authorizing execution of an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Cleveland Grove for overlaying for overlaying Chatham Road of the Office of Public Works for emergency passage. Understand that uh, 
I think the uh, grant hasn't been received, so we're going to move this to regular passage. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion on that? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to suspend the rules in place on first reading agenda number 2021-353. Ordinance authorizing execution of an agreement with Arch Images, Inc. for architectural design services for up to three fire stations in an amount not to exceed $750,000 for the Springfield Fire Department. So moved. Second. Second. Moved uh, second any discussion? Alderman Hanauer. Where are we looking at those uh, firehouses going? Uh, for sure, the one by Isles Park. Um, the second one is with regards to... Uh, Trying to think where the West uh, Road. Chatham Road, the yeah. one by uh, the Starbucks, and then the third one, um, we're looking at the options with regards to the third one. What would best uh, suit us for the um, response? Okay, but I'm sure we'll have more information as we come forward. I don't know if Chief Blau, if you want to add anything to that. And we are we're replacing firehouses. We're not adding three. Correct. Thank you. What can I answer for you? Well, I just was wondering which ones we were looking at and where where we or do we know where we want to replace them to? Because uh, I'm not going to lie, I've got I've got some areas that that are not getting covered real quick, as you know. And we've had our conversation. I'm not going to. Yep. And and I do think that we got to have something on the southwest part of town. It's the place that's growing the most. And you know, we got Unit 12, and uh, what is it on Wabash? Uh, 10. Uh, uh, eight, Station eight, 8 is over eight, on yeah. Monroe, and uh, just right by uh, but, Chatham but, Road. But uh, you know, Panther Creek, Piper Glen, um, the Reserve, Savannah Point. I mean, we need quicker times out there, and we. And I appreciate the fact that we've that we put together, you know, the the uh, the software or the hardware that that helps. That helps, uh, but we've got to do some, you know, we've got it right now. We we've got we need a house down there. We also need, you know, quite frankly, we've got a very serious problem with that Cockrell Lane bridge that hopefully someday we can. I'm hoping a truck hits that thing good and hard and it knocks Not it down and then we don't have that problem anymore. But right. so yeah, we're taking a look at how to better respond throughout Springfield. That's definitely one area we'll look at. Oh, we are looking at, I should say. Thank station you. station six is over is is the one that uh, basically has been blocked in by the rail project. That's yeah. over by Isles Park. Uh, that one, uh, we we're looking at a couple of locations uh, over in a similar area. We we don't want to move it. Uh, too far, we think it was well placed, uh, but we don't want to pull it away from the place that they respond the most, which it would still be in that same area. Um, and then the other one, uh, as the mayor uh, described, is, is Station 8, which is uh, on West Monroe. Uh, that one, uh, we have significant uh, traffic issues over by it. Uh, that Starbucks uh, tends to, to kind of make really bad congestion issues at that yes. at that intersection uh it's dangerous we're worried that somebody's going to end up getting hurt um, it's just a point of order excuse me sure. go ahead so are we discussing an ordinance that's really? been, that should be just discussing this next, next week, week. Right. yeah this is we're just uh, you can save it chief yeah okay. we're just trying to decide whether something <laughs> they waved at me and you weren't going to yell at me this time yeah. so i walked <laughs> up <laughs> i want to take the, the blame <laughs> <Hi. now>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, oh, Chief. For Thanks, Chief. Motion say aye. 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 Both say nay. <laughs> motion carries. Is there any unfinished business to come before the City Council? All the women descenso. Um, thank you, Mayor. I'm going to bring up a subject that I've brought up here on countless occasions and most recently in our last budget discussions where I said that there was an area around Washington Park that was a death waiting to happen. And on Friday night, that death happened. It was a dog, um, but my neighbor was dragged down Fayette. And I'd like to thank the Springfield Fire Department and Public Works for going to clean up the blood off the sidewalk and streets today that was still there um, on Williams Boulevard, on Fayette. 
Um, so I, I thank them for their efforts in removing some trauma from the area. But something's got to give in this area. This, is, this isn't a joke. I mean, a woman was run down. And if you've seen the video, you, you, would, you would gasp. It is that horrifying. And the person who did, and I don't blame engineering, I don't blame um, law enforcement, I blame the person who obviously ran someone down and knew they ran someone down and kept going. It's terrible. But we have got to do better at the area around Washington Park. And if it's in cooperation with the, with the park district, if it's working with them on higher back for um, you know, more enforcement in that area, it is a drag race from South Grand to Lawrence. And you can see that by the amount of accidents at those two intersections and everything in between. But we cannot continue to ignore this problem, which I have, con I have continued to bring up for four years, both in our budget process and my meetings with Public Works. Something's got to give. This is a pedestrian crossing. It's not that difficult. So I don't know why we can't have a functional pedestrian crossing at a very high traffic area. I don't know what's so hard about it. I know something was tried a few years ago. The signs were knocked over in a day. One day, the signs were on the streets. So this has affected um, Alderman McMenamin as well, because his, his ward is to the west of that area. There was a child that was hit on their bicycle a few years ago in that area. We've got to do better. I mean, this is an area that people want to use. This is a community that wants to walk and walk their dogs and use their bikes. So please, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to help you figure this out. But I cannot have another incident of someone who lives in my community being run over for walking their dog and then losing their dog in the process. And the uh, sad part of it is it's, I thought they were crossing MacArthur. They were crossing Fayette, which is just like a typical two-lane street. Mm -hmm. And someone barrels around there. And yeah, sad. Yeah, it's that's awful. a tragic situation. Alderman McMinimum. Yeah, Alder Woman DeCenso and I talked about this before the meeting, and you're correct. The, in this case, um, the uh, pedestrian was crossing Fayette, uh, walking north. Um, you know, there is a street light right above where she was walking, and unfortunately, both a private and a public tree blocks the illumination uh, where she was walking. And so this is a request to uh, our public works director. Uh, we've got to have a plan to trim trees that block the illumination uh, of pedestrians, especially at an intersection like that. And number two, historically, when we get, and older woman Connie and I had this discussion at a homeowners association meeting recently before the accident occurred, but um, when it comes to uh, tr uh, trimming trees, uh, apparently our practice is we ask permission of the private property owner w upon which the tree is located before we can trim underneath the street light. And I think we need an ordinance that says, hey, we're allowed to trim branches that block the street light, and Alderman Gregory, you and I also talked about this. We need the authority as a, as a city to do what's in the public safety, to trim those branches, even if it's coming from a tree on private property, that but hangs out into the public way. We need approval to trim those trees without having to ask the permission of the property owner. Uh, it just delays things, it's cumbersome, it's, it's time intensive. And if those trees were, we, I think we had an impaired driver uh, Friday night. I don't uh, want to speculate. I don't know if they were impaired or they were just um, a, a reckless a driver then, person. for sure. I've, I've seen the video also. Yes. And also, by the way, let's thank Mr. and Mrs. Deering, that's uh, Irv Smith's uh, son-in-law, that had the camera out there that was able to capture uh, the video of the car taking the turn real fast. And so it was a very fast turn. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. Um, I was rate. driving down the street at the same time, yeah. so this person could have been next to me. So that's a good example of um, homeowners giving the video to our police yeah. to hopefully uh, bring justice to what's happened here. Uh, but in summary, um, Public Works Director, we need to um, trim trees on uh, important uh, streetways where the streetlights are not illuminating 
and uh, I know that you've only, we've only got one tree trimming crew, sometimes two out there to do 700 miles of roadway, and uh, I'll vote for additional personnel to trim our trees for safety. And, and, and we can we can trim basically the right away line goes straight up, so right. we can trim the street lights. And more importantly, I mean, we have all we have to start promoting our city as a walkable city. People want to walk especially in the area that I live in, in older neighborhoods. They want to walk. They want to walk to the park. They want to walk down the street. They want to, you know, they want to walk to church. Um, I agree, and that's why we've um, obviously applied for safety improvement funds. We've done road diets. We're doing one right now on You're Walnut doing one Street. Right now. Yes. Um, we just uh, received safety funds, which we're working on the plans in that area for MacArthur and Walnut, and MacArthur and Lawrence and Walnut and Lawrence. So and, we're continuing the, to I'm, improve that area. And um, also, we do have our QBS process out, and we'll look at safety projects, and we'll evaluate that area and have an engineer look at look at MacArthur Boulevard between South Grand Avenue and MacArthur Boulevard is, is one of our next studies. And I appreciate that. And I think we need to start looking, being a little more forward thinking and, and talking about pro protected bike lanes, uh, which we don't have in Springfield. Um, people want to bike to the park safely. My 13-year-old bikes over there all the time, and every time I'm like, call me when you get there, because um, it's that scary to cross you know, into the park. Yeah. And I think we have done a great job. Um, we've added a lot of bike uh, lanes and route mileage Absolutely. over the last few years, and we continuously um, will look at doing that. And, you know, obviously it depends upon the infrastructure, how wide the roads are, with what we can do with uh, with protective bike lanes versus um, bike uh, bike routes versus sidewalks and multi-use trails. So we'll continue to, to do that and always up for any ideas. But pedestrian crossings cannot be this difficult. They just can't because it, it's not... But if you would look uh, along uh, the tree crew, along with um, whoever using for CWLP, along MacArthur and trim all the trees, make sure there's no uh, light obstruction. Alderman Redpath. In addition to that, the new bike trail out there, there was a, a tree that uh, was damaged when in the construction. It's hanging over the hilltop bike trail. There's a limb about this big and it's about to fall on the bike trail and on our power lines. And your team went out there today to look at it and uh, they said it's on park property and they've, already, they've been asking the park and asking the park and asking the park to, to go take care of it. And they said they will, but they just don't do it. Uh, we've made the complaint. So if the liability comes back, it's gonna go back to the park district because they're not taking care of their business. We so I appreciate it if you follow up with that. <laughs> yeah, and, and then, um, I just got one other question for Corporation Council. Um, do we, we do have a noise ordinance about loud music, correct? Well, the police department's been out to a house in my ward several times. I know everybody's got this problem, but I'm just saying it. <laughs> that there's been a house in my ward that uh, I get complaints on all the time. They go out there, tell them turn it down. As soon as they leave, they turn it right back up. Is there any action that we can be taken with these people on fines or, or anything else? Because they, the they, the people are telling us that our police action is not it's not working. Um, if the if the uh, officers document that uh, with a police report, then there can be ordinance violations filed. Okay, I got the I got the the emails and stuff. I'll I'll make sure I get those. All right, to thank you, you very much. Yes. Do, do you know how many times they've been out? You know, what uh, period of time? I can't give you. I can't give you. A, they've been out there several times on the one house. No, so no, we can. All right, thank you very much. We'll check. How many times? Lots. Okay. Alderman Gregory, then Alderman Conley, then Alderman Donnelly. I just got a quick question. So, <clears throat> this will be for um, our public works team. Uh, is 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 it our time for tree limbs over on the east side of town? Because I'm looking at this thing, and I'm, the you know, I'm pretty swift at it. But I, next week. Next week. But when we do it, please, because I'm already having a hard time believing we can hit every street. But I, I'm, um, you know, I, I, I really have received an awful amount of complaints on, on tree limbs and um, 
you know, and, and, and you know, I've been taking a, a good ride through there, and we, we definitely have an overabundance uh, in, in my ward of tree limbs and down. I sent you a big one um, the other day, and that's, you know, they're, they're smaller ones, but I think uh, a combination of the storms, of course, and, and, and you know, um, a couple of them between the last pickup um, has really affected it, especially over over in my ward, it's older trees, and that's that goes back to um, Autumn and McMiniman's point of, of trying to really save some of those that's hanging across the the um, streets and things, especially, I mean, they're so old, and, and, and I would really, you know, like to work on that, trying to identify some of the older ones, especially on the city portions, and, and trying to see what we can do with them. So yeah, definitely you. let us know. We can put in service requests and work orders to get those taken care of. Uh, in regards to where we're at right now, we are starting, we're in the southeast area at this okay. time, so um, that's basically um, south of South Grand and then west of MacArthur, Walnut area at this time, or okay. east, of, east of that, I apologize. Uh, and then we'll be in the northeast area next week. Right. And then I know we do have a lot down um, from the storm, so yeah. we'll yeah. definitely be making sweeps okay. throughout the city after we wrap up the program okay. as well as All right, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Alderman Conley. Thank you, Mayor. I actually just kind of wanted to follow up on Alderman Redpath. Um, if we could, Corporation Council, get some more clear guidance on this noise issue. I actually just just today had a phone call on the exact same issue where people are repeated calls for or cons issues with noise in a you know the police come out it gets turned down yep we're going to put in some soundproofing and then the police leave because and the sound goes right back up so if we could just have some clear guidance to everybody so that we know i mean i can tell people look this is what has to happen and and then and then everyone knows what this what the, what the procedures are and we can see some some enforcement on this because it it really is a it's one of those quality of life issues that that makes a huge impact on people. Uh, we can circulate some inf excuse me uh, information on it. Thank you, and and, we'll, and that'll be shared with the police department too, right? So they uh, we're all correct. It's <clears throat> the department. There's actually uh, I think there's pretty specific guidance on what to do with it, but I'll uh, take a look and make sure that gets circulated if the officers document it, then we can take action on it. Okay, thank you. I'd love to get a copy of that. Thank you. Yes, Mandala? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. You know, on the noise-related front, um, I've been hesitant to bring this up because I didn't know how this council would react, but this is an issue that has come up time and time again, and I know I've talked to some of you at this horseshoe about this very issue, and it is noise-related, but and I think that's how it's been tried to be abated. But how many of you around the horseshoe here have had problems with roosters? Raise your hand. I got a few roosters. 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 No cock and doodle do. Yeah. Well, I have a, I have another. It came up just this past week where we have. I have a resident that had this issue, and she sent me a recording. I'm not going to play it. I, I thought about it, but I'm not going to play it. But, and it was. It's very loud, and the police department goes out, and of course, it's not unlike a barking dog. They have to uh, hear the problem as it's occurring. But my question is to Corporation Council. Uh, she's, this lady happens to be from New Jersey originally. Are, do, do cities in Illinois, our size, have ordinances and rules and regs that regulate barnyard animals, such as roosters? Or turkeys. <laughs> He's, he has turkeys. I, have, I don't have the rooster anymore. I have turkeys. Turkeys. There's a, like three or four of them in a backyard. And there's no neighborhood association to to deal with it. Hmm. <laughs> Rains don't drown. I mean, and, and you know, to piggyback on that, Mayor, if you don't mind, to piggyback on that, I seriously, I mean, it's question. technically in the city of Springfield, I think that you <laughs> yeah. can, right now we do not have a barnyard right. type ordinance. You can have goats and whatever, but that problem. There's not, and there's not really anything that we could do um, Do you want to go through the list of permitted animals or the restricted animals? Um, what I was going to what I was going to say is that, uh, and you're, it, be, it's it's funny, but it isn't funny I, if you're a neighbor that's got to buy. Up. You know, I got a couple. It's not funny at all. I, I mean, so. th this lady, uh, she's she you know it was 5:30 in the morning and oh loud as can be, and it's not the first time this has happened. And the neighbor was very cooperative and said he'd be happy to get rid of the uh, rooster within the next six months. Well, that's not good enough, obviously. So. Anyway, Mr. Corporation Counsel. I was, I was simply going to say that uh, there are some restrictions related to what kind of animals, and certainly for any commercial purpose, 
Uh, I will uh, circulate that information. There are some very specific restrictions. However, that being said, uh, normally the relate normally the restrictions are tied to uh, commercial type activities. <laughs> there it is. There it is. It's proof. <laughs> So we'll, uh, he'll circulate yeah, that. No, I, we may I'll have to bring an ordinance forward if we want to restrict it to any yes. further nature, because uh, as you say, that it's uh, not restricted right now. And, and we did have a goat issue as well as uh, with all seriousness. So anyway, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Is there any other unfinished business, or was that new business? No, it was unfinished. Any new business? I have on new business. Alderman and Desenso, and then Alderman Donnelly. Um, we had a huge storm last Thursday, and I just wanted to thank uh, Public Works, our CWLP linemen, um, the fire department who had 133 calls for service. Uh, you know, our city workers really came through last week. It was a it was a major event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I had someone without power for 13 hours, so um, last Thursday was no joke, and I want to just tell the city of Springfield and all of our employees how much we appreciate everything you did. Um, going out in those conditions is not ideal. Streets were blocked. People didn't have power. Um, so thank you for the long hours you worked. And uh, I won't be thanking you when we see that overtime, but thank you for now. <laughs> Absolutely. Madonna. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and, and to build upon that, uh, you know, I have friends that lived uh, just outside the city, and they were on Ameren, and it took literally days to get back on. So kudos to our men and women in the CWLP. Um, Mayor, the reason I wanted to say something under new business is we all got kind of a curveball thrown at us last week. And uh, I haven't been alderman uh, terribly long, but since, since 2015. And since that time, we've uh, had seven. This would be the seventh time this has happened where one of our colleagues has left. And uh, I just want to say that, uh, Alderman Proctor, I understand this is your last council meeting this evening. It will be. And, uh, you know, I got to know you uh, a few years ago. I didn't know you at all. And it's been a pleasure working with you. Uh, your passion, your commitment uh, is unquestionable. And uh, thank, you, thank you for all you did for the city of Springfield and your constituents, and we'll miss you. But we know you're going to be working at the Capitol, so we still get to see you now and then. So all the best. Great. Thank you much. Appreciate it. And he'll be chair at next Tuesday, or uh, no, week from he'll be gone. Oh, oh you're gone. Oh, I have a meeting. Oh, boy, we missed that one. <laughs> he stuck me with three. Yep. Oh, it him always back messes me up. Plaque here. <laughs> uh, actually, Tim Griffin, do you have the plaque? Yeah, I put it in your office this afternoon. Did you really? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will invite you back to a special presentation. <laughs> we'll have treats in the council coordinator's office afterwards. All right, thank you. How about that. So, yeah, we wish you the best. We really appreciate your service. I know Enos Park in downtown will miss you because you've been a great advocate uh, for them, a good voice for the residents. I have a speech, but I wouldn't be able to make it through. So I just want to say it's an honor and a privilege, and thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you. Well, now who's going to be my work you. husband? What's that? I said, now who's going to be my work husband? I think Joe. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Mesh. <laughs> I think you left him speechless. I do have some news, though. I became a grandfather last week. Oh. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh. First time. That's a fun group. Any other new business? We do have uh, some individuals signed up to speak. First is Simone White in company. Hello. It's good to see everyone again. My name is Simona yep. White, you. and I live at 300 South Durkin Drive, Springfield, Illinois, 62704. <clears throat> and I have with me today my Mid-Illinois Western Regional Board of Director members and the American Cancer Society Network. Um, it's the federal division. And Teresa is an ambassador legislative for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. And Mr. Roger Crawford, he is the state of Illinois, American Cancer Society 
he is the SLA lead for it. So I'm going to let him talk, and she's going to be the model, and I'm going to scoot over. Modeling the bad The American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network is the nation's leading advocate for public policies that are helping defeat cancer. And ACS CAN gives a voice to those impacted by the disease as they encourage lawmakers at all levels of government to join the fight and make cancer a national priority. And the issues we work on are cancer research funding, obviously. Every major advancement in cancer care has come as a result of cancer research. Strong smoking laws and increased taxes on cigarettes. Um, tobacco is still um, a risk factor for more than 13 cancers. Life-saving screening programs, access to quality, affordable health care. More than 300,000 people a year die because they don't have access or they can't afford health care. So uh, every year, and uh, the, the Cancer Action Network is 20 years old, and for 20 years, we, I should say for 18 years, every year we would have a Lights of Hope ceremony in Washington, D.C., and the Lights of Hope represent someone who has been diagnosed with cancer or who has lost their fight with cancer. And last year, with the pandemic, we were not able to do that, so we moved into a Lights of Hope around America. And Mayor Langfelter was gracious enough on a very short notice to allow us to put some Lights of Hope bags around the fountain out here to my right. And um, with that, it, it put the seed in, can we make this better? Because I think all of us know someone who's been diagnosed with cancer, whether, whether it's a relative, co-worker, yep. someone at church. And how many times have we said to that individual when they told us they've been diagnosed with cancer, let me know if there's something I can do? Well, I can tell you, by becoming an advocate for them, you are doing more than you can do any other way. You're adding your voice to help them get through what they're doing and, and hopefully sometime have a world without cancer. So Lights of Hope is what we do to raise awareness. And so this year in Springfield, we're making it bigger. Um, we are looking to let me back up just a second. There are 16.9 million cancer survivors in the United States. Over 600,000 of those are in Illinois, and over 5,000 of them are in Springfield, Illinois. So what we would like to try and do is have a Lights of Hope bag for every cancer survivor in Springfield, Illinois. If we are able to pull this off, will be the first city in the nation that's ever done this. And we wouldn't even thought about this had it not been for the pandemic. Um, so we are gonna have an event on August 28th. And when I told Mayor Langfelter there were 5,000 uh, cancer survivors in Springfield, <coughs> Again, we were going to do this around the fountains here, and he goes, well, I don't know that we can, that's going to be too crowded. So we're going to have five different locations in Springfield that we're doing that. Um, so we have a Springfield, Illinois, uh, Lights of Hope page set up. Um, we have a QR code so people can just scan their phone and buy Lights of Hope bags. We also have corporate sponsorships 
Uh, so businesses can get involved. They start at $200, 350, 500, and 1,000. Um, so if there, if you know some businesses who would like to get involved in this, um, appreciate knowing that. And uh, we thank the city of Springfield for their commitment for doing this and thank Mayor Langfelter for his commitment as well. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Don Norton. Good evening and thank you very much. My name is Don Norton. I live at 3120 Butler Street here in Springfield. Um, one thing, I, I'm here actually to talk about the panhandling law, but I do want to ask one question to the council. They were talking about the homeless and the housing and affordable housing. I would like to know what y'all think affordable housing is. I received $795 in Social Security and by the time I pay my rent, I have nothing. After I pay my electric and, and rent, I have nothing. Landlord that I'm living with now just bought the place. He's booting everybody out so he can renovate the buildings. That means that I have to come up with a little over $3,000 to move into a new place. Come September 31st, I'm going to be homeless again. I pray that I'm not. I spoke with Josh out there. He's going to help, you know, try and help and, and get us some some um, referrals or whatever where we can get into some place. But I just wanted to mention that. I don't know what, all, what you all say affordable housing is. To me, anything over $500 is not affordable housing. Not for me with my Social Security. And my wife, unfortunately, doesn't receive Social Security or work at the present time, and she's getting ready to go in for a lung transplant. So anyway, I'm here to speak on the uh, panhandling. One, I, I have to take some fault for all this because I am the person who sued the city years ago to get the ordinance for the legality for people to stand on the street corner and hold a sign. I agree, it's gotten out of hand. I do agree. When I see people lying on the ground, drinking alcohol, smoking pot, and doing what other drugs are doing, and you know, covered up. Some of them you don't even know if they got clothing on underneath there. I find, I find that appalling. I do. But the thing is, I understand what you said. If I have to stand 30 feet from, the, from a street corner to solicit for uh, donations or for voter registrations or whatever, that we can't, that, that's, not, that's not necessary. Our First Amendment says we have the right to stand and speak where we need to speak. ACLU has already said that they were going to, if this ordinance passes, that they were going to file a lawsuit. I spoke with my lawyer, Mark Weinberg, who was the lawyer who sued. Some of you council members were here when, when that was taking place. Um, he suggested that you know, he would also file a lawsuit. I suggest that we find some other means to curb those people that are doing this the wrong way. We, we never wanted it, and we've always said to begin with when we started this seven, eight years ago, aggressive panhandling is a no-no. I see it all over the city, people walking up to people, pounding on doors and stuff, and I try to convert to them. Stop, please. You are doing everything wrong. This is how it should be, and I try to explain to them. It falls on deaf ears because these people, they obviously don't care. But I would like to find out if we can get together and we can find a uh, legal means without changing the ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Tom Schaefer. Thank you, Mayor. It's a pleasure to see everybody at the council tonight. I rise for a rather unusual request. On the other side of Lincoln Lending Library is a statue. It's a statue of Lincoln. Can I pass around the picture, Mayor? Sure. When the artist 
made the statue. He said he didn't think everybody would be wowed by it. He's exactly correct. Mayor, would you like one? I think I've seen it, but yeah, we'll pass it around. Thank you. Uh, it's even more hideous than real life. The picture doesn't do it justice. Uh, I'll take you back in a little audio journey to November of 1976. The Springfield Art Association got together, found some artists, a fellow named Pattison from Chicago, and they commissioned him to make a statue, and they were going to give it to the city for allowing the city council building to house their artwork. So in November of 76, they dedicated the statue. There were 50 people present at that dedication. It's, it's the south entrance of Lincoln Library, right in the middle of the south door. That's the statue. When the drape was pulled off the statue, there was an audible gasp from the people that were assembled because the nature of the artwork was so difficult to understand, so abstract, so unlike the real Lincoln, who was a tall, thin guy, an athlete, a wrestler, a, a nice dresser, a beautiful order, a son of Springfield who gave his life in the service of his country. To be depicted in this statue that you're looking at is an affront to Capitol Avenue, to Lincoln Library. It's the closest statue to Lincoln's home. I measured it this morning. It's 300 feet away from the front door of his house. It disrespects Lincoln. We just spent millions to redo Capitol Avenue. It's a beautiful street. It disrespects the library. It drags down Capitol Avenue. The people with their children that come to the library are scared of the statue. Now, it's had 45 years in its current location a prominent location. It's had 45 years. Ladies and gentlemen, I say to you, it does not deserve 46. Don't get me wrong. I don't want it destroyed. I don't want it dropped into the bottom of Lake Springfield. I've spoken, I've taken the liberty to speak with a wonderful art educated woman named Betsy Dollar at the Springfield Art Association. She'd love to have this statue. Just like it was given to us We'd like the city of Springfield to give it to her, where it can be placed in a more appropriate setting, an art museum, where, it can, where its abstract nature can be explained. Really, it's not even washed. You can see the photo. It hasn't been washed in 46 years. The tourists don't stop and take photos with it. Even the homeless don't like it. Nobody else understands it. I'm not an art guy. I'm not certainly not an art critic. But I like Remington, I like Russell, I like uh, all kinds of abstract painting. But, but the placement of this statue is inappropriate. And it has been inappropriate for 45 years. In fact, the people that were assembled when it was unveiled believed it was inappropriate. And I think that it, it presents us, statues are being moved all over. They removed two from the Capitol grounds. They're gonna remove the Martin Luther King statue and maybe upgrade it to a more appropriate statue. I totally agree with that movement. There was a statue at St. Al's School that was inappropriate. It was removed. Just because something gets 45 years doesn't mean that it deserves 145 years. I'd like to behoove this council to go out after the meeting or tomorrow in dawn's early light and take a look at it and see if you think that it's appropriate or if the city could do better. Because this small shadow of this statue, it sends a, casts a shadow along Capitol. It casts a shadow along the Lincoln Library, which is a beautiful library. I go there three times a week. It casts a shadow on Lincoln's home and the tourists that come from Japan and Europe. And the very first thing that they come out of Lincoln's home, 300 feet away, is this statue of our native son, Abraham Lincoln. Clearly, we can do better. It would, the cost to remove it and move it over to the Art Association would be minimal. Minimal. And it, it opens up a new window of opportunity for the south side of Lincoln Library, for the just redone Capitol Avenue, and, it, and put anything else there. The UIS is now having an art contest for Lincoln. And we could showcase those. There's a dozen of them. And we could showcase those at that venue. It opens up, and, and we could put it in a nice spot where tourists could be explained to them, and they could take photos with it. Maybe it would, in its way, even get more publicity, which I hate to do to it, but it would be in a more appropriate setting. 
and, and, that, and bring new life to the south side of the library uh, for minimal, minimal cost. And I would just ask that you look in your heart and, and look at the photo that you're allowed, you're welcome to keep. I hope I haven't given anybody a nightmare <laughs> by showing that photo because it's, man, it's ugly. It, we could do better. And, and so close to Lincoln's home, I think it's a disservice. So I won't belabor the point. I think I've made it clearly that uh, I've never asked for art or a statue to be removed or moved in my entire life. But I did this, even my grandson, and I want to congratulate the new grandparent on the council. My grandson, three years old, took one look at it and said, it's yucky. <laughs> it's yucky. <laughs> if a three-year-old can have the common sense to know what this group of common sense has, I think it tells you we need to make this change. I thank you so very much, Mayor, for tonight. I thank everybody. I know the city has a lot of problems with everything from homeless to people run over. Running a city is a tough job. I also wanted to say in closing that I wanted to thank Alderman Proctor for his service, and I think that this council and this time of our city, after a horrible pandemic, has done the most for our city of many, many councils. I'm a, a long-time, lifelong resident of Springfield. This council has come together, has coalesced. I'm not just trying to stroke you because I want your vote on this statue. You guys have been a good bunch, and I mean that, a good bunch. Thank you so very much, Mayor. It's a pleasure. Well, we, we appreciate your uh, passion on this issue, and uh, truly in that statue's case, the beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So we will uh, take it under consideration to have those uh, discussions with Betsy Dollar at the Springfield Art Association. <laughs> You know, Mayor, we always give the departing alderman a present. Uh, maybe, maybe that's right. <laughs> maybe we could give would you that like that? Would you like the statue? I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> Very good. And his, and his uh, son's name's Lincoln. Perfect. Next, we have uh, Sam Arnold. You won't forget us very quickly. We just point of order. Are we running the clock? I mean, we're kind of going over with each speaker. Sure. We, we yeah, I can't see. Yeah. Okay. It's well, just the clock is I'm coming. keeping time too, and we're running over. Yeah. Okay. Hello. You state your name and address for the council. We'd appreciate it. And we used to show it on the on the board, so that our speakers know. Yes. My name yes. is Sam Arnold. I live at 2231 North Third Street. As of just about a month and a half ago, because the council here and the mayor knows that uh, the city tore up the house over there on 6th Street, so I had to find another place to go. But now I'm getting into a conflict, and I need somebody to intervene because township says, no, it's the city's problem. City says, no, it's the township problem, okay, because... It's, it's, the issue is a double standard issue. The public here in Springfield, Public Works has got an order out saying, well, your grass has got to be no more than eight inches, otherwise we're going to come in, we're going to mow it and charge you $250. Well, the city property, they can let it grow up to eight feet tall and no recourse. The township, let it grow up eight feet tall, 10 feet tall. Now, I'm gonna, I showed some people what my granddaughter come running up to me, says, Papa, Papa, there's a snake. Well, I said, this snake is the garter snake. And they said, no, no, no. Snake. No, it's a black snake. It's one of the aggressive ones with the red mouth. It's coming out of the ditch line that's overgrown. Ten feet tall. Hmm. Now I know for a fact, each and every one of us would not allow your kids or your grandkids to play in the yard. But that. Earlier today, 
there was a guy that was in my yard doing some work and he jumped back and there was another one. Okay? So far this week, I've had seven of them in my yard. Now, I'll tell you this, and each and every one of you should know, do the same thing. If any of my kids or my grandkids get hurt by being out in the yard with one of these uh, six, six foot snakes, okay, there's going to be hell to pay. Well, we'll have a public it take, it's, it's either the township's problem or the city's problem. Because off of Sangman Avenue on the third, there's a ditch line that needs to be redone, comes down, goes east to west, that needs to be totally redone. I've, I've had, I've hired a kid to come in and start cutting it down because nobody seems what they want to do it. Well, we'll send uh, someone out to look at it and get with the public health department because that's who should be looking at animal control with regards animal to the snake says, issue. No, they won't handle it. Well, we'll uh, make contact with them and try to figure out uh, how to remedy the situation. You know, because the ditch line goes right right around my property that I've got. Well, we'll have someone out there tomorrow. You know. Yeah, it's uh, 2231 North 3rd. Right. Okay. It's on the north side of Lincoln Park. Okay. Well, now, thank you for letting us know. I've, I've been letting people know. I've sent thank you. Mr. Proctor here pictures and stuff. You know. We'll have someone go out and figure out the uh, jurisdictional boundaries and take care of it once and for all. Okay, I okay. appreciate that. Now, the second issue is, okay, I'm getting ready to, I want, I want a meeting with you in your office, okay? If you, I don't know who, who I can contact, because there's a couple other things I want to discuss with you directly before we blow it out. Related to this property? Or no. Something else? Something okay. else. Yeah, if you contact my office tomorrow, we'll schedule something. Okay. I appreciate that very much, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very Thank good. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You too, sir. Anybody else wish to address the council? If you come forward and state your name and address, we'd appreciate it. Tired, <laughs> hungry, <laughs> and hardworking citizens. <laughs> My name is Shatria Smith, 2040 Gregory Court, Springfield, Illinois, 62703. I've addressed this council before with the Faith Coalition for the Common Good. I am here today in regards to the Garvey Tubman Cultural Arts and Research Center. Um, being that this late time of the evening, I would like to defer my conversation as we did put in an application to speak to the council today and I am unsure why we weren't called to be spoken to or listened to. I will put in my request today to come back to next Tuesday's meeting because we are all tired and I do appreciate your time. Should be, it will be in two weeks, I think. In Last two weeks. Tuesday of August. Next Tuesday in August. Last, Last Tuesday. Last, Last Tuesday. August. Yep. Okay, that would be perfect. Let me document that. And it, it's a much shorter agenda, and I'll be running the meeting, so it'll go much quicker. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to the mayor. We had a lot going on tonight. I but mind you, I do <laughs> would like, before I stop, uh, finish and just say adieu for the evening, 
to give you our mission statement, I, to the best of my ability, do have a business plan available for you, and I would love to share that with you uh, via email as we are trying to make sure our paper product is uh, low. The mission of the Garvey Tubman Cultural Arts and Research Center is to provide services of interest in the African American community, sharing viable support system that speaks to the community's educational, emotional, and cultural needs by providing high quality, child friendly, and relevant subject matter. Garvey Tubman meets the mission through educational programs for youths ages five to 17 for future success in Springfield students. We provide facilitated instructions with professional artists supporting emerging artists' minds. Garvey Tubman empowers through creativity, showcasing marketing skills, sales, self-promotion through a mix of artistic learning that will foster lifelong connections and friendships. Our authentic program is the only one of its kind in Springfield, Illinois, and I look forward to telling you more about it at the end of the month. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the council? Is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you. It's cold. Uh, may I also address the council? Can y'all turn the heat up? Y'all tried to kill me today. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Let's get it done. It might have been a reflection of yours sitting there. I got hot flight. But he got a pen. Oh, is that your pen? Somebody's is. Thank <laughs> you.